Are we good? A very good morning. Good morning to everybody. Good morning, everybody. I welcome you to day two of the Saatchi Chair in Enabled Environment and Assistive Living Research and Innovation Seminar. I welcome you once again. You're welcome. Those who are joining us online, I welcome you. You're welcome to this hybrid seminar. It is now 9.27. We are going to start with the program at exactly 9.30. So get uh, settled. We are going to start with the program at 9.30. My name is Ria Mojapilu, and I will be your program director again for today. So um, I welcome you once again to this exciting, enlightening, and informative session where we're going to get uh, uh, more insights on the different subject relating to the Sachi Chair in Enabled Environment and Assistive Living. Thank you. We'll start at 9.30. Good morning once again to all our esteemed delegates. Those also that are joining us online, welcome once again. A very good morning to you. I welcome you once again to the second day of the Sanchi Chair in Enabled Environment and Assistive Living, Assistive Living Research and Innovation Seminar. We are um, beginning with the program. I just want to uh, encourage you to familiarize yourself with the program uh, that you received at registration table. Um, just to also uh, take note that we will take breaks in between. And also just a few announcements for you to know um, the bathroom as you leave the auditorium, you walk straight down and you will see the sign. As you walk into the passage, you turn right, the ladies is on the left and the female, uh, the, the female is on the left and the male is on the right. Thank you so much. At this point in time of the program, I'd like to call um, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Research, Innovation and Engagement, Dr. Vatiswa 
Babu Zamgaga to come and do the welcome, as well as the introduction to today's seminar. Over to you, Deputy Vice Chancellor. Thank you so much. Let's welcome her. Sanmonan. Ah, Sanmonan. Dumelang. Abshen. Molwen. Huyamore. Good morning, <laughs> Program Director, distinguished guests, um, representatives uh, from academia and industry, both in South Africa and in France, Sony University of Technology Management staff and student leadership, as well as student fraternity at large, um, colleagues, good morning. Welcome to day two of this exciting and important research and innovation seminar that has demonstrated the impact of a rich bilateral collaboration that has been in existence between South Africa and France for almost 25 years. As was shared yesterday, the vibrant collaboration has made a tremendous impact on human capital development, research and innovation. This was clearly evident in the various um, <clears throat> in the various technology, uh, technology demonstrations and the keynote speeches made by various speakers from various spheres, government and industry, academia, both in South Africa and in France. Ladies and gentlemen, as we continue to celebrate the great work done by our research chair in enabled environment and assistive living, led by Professor Karim Dojan, we continue to remind ourselves of the need to translate our research and innovation activities towards achieving a societal impact while maintaining our main role as a university of human capital development. As a university, our mission is to be a people's university that makes knowledge work. As part of this mission, TUT embraces engaged scholarship in which learning, teaching, research and engagement are integrated with our everyday realities. Our university is committed towards breaking down the ivory towers of academia by finding authentic and enduring solutions to our community's most pressing problems. As we continue to celebrate the achievements, we continue to remind ourselves of the tremendous societal challenges faced by our people that um, rather that is faced by people exper <clears throat> that experience different forms of disability today with the limitation brought by the lack of the adequate health and basic education, the experience of economic isolation with very little prospects of securing employment. With the various important presentations that were shared yesterday that stimulated several potential areas of collaboration, May we continue to strive to seek strategic partnerships to advance the research agenda through an entrepreneurial approach to educate, <clears throat> to education rather, entrepreneurial approach to education, which will contribute to the elevation of the high unemployment burden, inequality, as well as poverty in our country. As highlighted yesterday, in this huge societal challenge that we face in South Africa and globally, let us continue to run together, colleagues, so that we run far. May today's engagement with the various uh, presenters from our French academic partners, UPEC, UPSE, and UNIFL Uni industries that will be presenting today, and our TUT staff continue to stimulate this call to collaborate even further. As I close, ladies and gentlemen, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived the great things that God has prepared for Twenty University of Technology. Have a blessed day ahead. I thank you. Thank you so much to the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Dr. Babu Zamgara. Um, to kickstart our keynote address this morning, um, to address the Sachi Chair on the subject of research and innovation at the service of people with disabilities, uh, discussion around 
our approach is Professor Eric Manasseli from LISV Laboratory from the University of Paris, Saclay. Ladies and gentlemen, let us please welcome to the stage Professor Eric Manasseli. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for inviting me. So I think I could remove this. OK, thank you. So my presentation will be a, more an overview, an open discussion presentation. It will be something from research to innovation, how to do it. So I choose some, pre some project. One is very dedicated to, for clinician, for rehabilitation center. The second will be more for user. And the last one is an opening project that I'm doing now uh, around dancing. And if there is one point you need to understand from my talk, it will, it will be how to promote participation for user. That's very important to understand that uh, objective uh, above my works. Ah, sorry. So I'm coming from Lisve Lab. So as uh, you heard yesterday, we are in the middle of Paris-Saclay. So it's very easy. We are a technical place uh, dedicated for sensor, for robotic, and for assistive technology. So one, two or three slides about some key figures about handicap. When we say handicap, we say it's a niche. But if you see all the, the, the figure, all the, uh, the market, Today we talk about uh, innovation. We could say that handicap is not a niche. 10% uh, of uh, the person around the world uh, say they got mobility difficulties. So if we go uh, to face this problematic, it's not a niche. It's a big thing. For example, uh, just if we take the market of wheelchair, 1% of the population use a wheelchair. So if we innovate in wheelchair, it's a big market. 1% is greater than Canada. Uh, wheelchair today is 4 5 billion and is going to 8 billion. And 30% of this market is US with a big company who has got 70% of the market is in vacuum. So we have place to innovate. And for researcher in this field, we have to deal with three steps. One is the research, it's classical. The second is to validate with the end user. That's very important for us to go to the, the end user and to make evaluation, to have tools for that. And the last point is the innovation with the constraint of the industry. And we need to deal with the theoretical contribution, the experimentation, the publication, and then the validation, the protocol to validate, and then all the the process of industri industrialization. The idea behind that is to go really to the user. The end user needs to have the, the innovation. So for that, we have at the beginning to use really the need. For that, we have the user, we have some association, we have rehab, rehab center to discuss, to obtain really the need. The need are not only the researcher need, it's also the user need. The second point is the validation. So for that, we have got in our lab an expert center to do evaluation, but we have also rehab center, clinician, everywhere. And at the end, we need to have also partner company, for example, or some accelerator to create some startup like you did here. In Paris-Saclay, in France, we have some fund coming from university, coming from partner, and coming from uh, the equivalent of NRF. It's INR for the agency for the financement. And then for the validation, it's always complex to found, to finance the validation. So we have the university, but we differ. sometimes we have some foundation. For the innovation, it's not easier, but we have some structure, partner, but we have what we call SAT, it's an accelerator, uh, belongs to the university to help for the POC, for the proof of concept, for the maturation of the project. And for with that, we can go to the uh, innovation. So I choose three projects to, to, to explain these uh, steps, uh, three different experiences to go to the innovation. 
The first one is the BCAP. So BCAP, I think someone knows this project. It's a platform to evaluate the capacity of the person to drive. It, today in France, it's coming something important uh, for elderly person who want to keep driving. So we need to evaluate. For that, uh, we develop a platform uh, to, to place the, the person in driving situation. So uh, coming from the need, we do the prototype, we do some tests, and we do industrialization. For this project, we had the finance coming from an insurance, MAIF, and we do all the process from the beginning to the end. Today, it was uh, from the rehab center expression, and today we could sail this. We have four uh, dispositive uh, uh, solution going to the rehab. And next year, it will be 20. And here, the système, prototype. On va so it's basic for a uh, In the prototype, the person who has all the systems to be found uh, adaptive uh, vehicles. We do the prototype, and we do all the tests. From that, we go with a supplier uh, going to the system. At the end, it's not a simulator, but we could simulate and we could do all the tests. Today, we have uh, the different configuration of driving. We could simulate visual acuity uh, impairment. We have all the performance analysis, and then we can report to the rehab center all the information. And we could come back to the research Coming from the, all the data we have, we could also apply some classifier, some uh, model uh, of the user, behavior model, so on. So there is a close loop between the innovation and the research, even at the end. Second project, Geolif. So yesterday we, we saw on the presentation uh, a basic uh, two-wheel balance. Today, this one is more innovative. It's uh, a two-wheel balance that you can go stand up in the system. So at the beginning, the need come from a uh, father. We develop the POC in the lab, a PhD, with two students coming from uh, FSAT, and we do the prototype. With this prototype, we go to the French uh, president. It was Hollande at this moment, uh, President Hollande. We receive many prizes. The, the student, the PhD student go on startup, and today we have for the next year, we have the possibility to sell uh, B2B or B2C or to company or to end user. So it's a, also a closed loop with research. So here, the, the product we obtain, several situation. You see the, uh, the verticalization, the standing up position with all the, the team. And today we include uh, strategy to analyze the stress behavior of the user, the driver. So for that, we come back to the research. We use camera embedded. We analyze with the color of the skin the stress of the, the user. Then we use different solutions. So we choose PPG, so the analysis of the skin, and we do the publication. So we have, even in the solution, the closed loop. And my last point, sorry, I go because of the time minute. My last project is about dance. So remember, my step is around how to promote the participation of the user. And the idea behind this project is to go to the activity. And dance mix physical activity and mental and, and emotional activity. Emotion is very important. You heard yesterday several projects in FSAT. So it's a new project. So, the impact of this technology has to be seen at the, the mix between art, physical, and education. As education, we said that just before with the DVC, is very important. Okay, so remember that even the person in situation of handicap or disability, a lot of persons want to do activity, want to do sport, want to do everything they want, not I want. And each year it's coming up 10%. We have in France the, the opportunity of the Paralympic 
the game, the Olympic game for persons in disability. So there are many uh, opportunities and the benefit must be for all, for elderly persons, but also for uh, the disabled person, for all, in fact, for everyone. And uh, not only uh, for the, the technologic, but also because mobility and activity is important for the person. And the market, because we spoke about innovation, is very important. So two examples of this. The, it's, it's not innovation. It's something you can find today. In the right video, you have my friend Gladys. I hope we could come back here to show you the presentation. To, to. She dances. She's an expert dancer in a wheelchair. She dances with uh, Maxime, who is coming from the opera, the French uh, National Opera. And in, on the level, you have another example. So dance could be cross. Here, I don't have an example with the elderly person, but you know better than me that dance is very something that cross everyone in the in the society. So what about research? Two projects. One is coming from Rolling Dance Chair. It's an American university. So you will see a robotic approach. So in this case, the upper part of the dancer is free to move and then to express the system. So you see the example of uh, Prof. Maurice. But the system is not autonomous. The, uh, the lady dancing could move, but just move sitting. Second example of research. So here you have a, a great project with uh, Walker, with Nico. So here it is another project of Walker uh, developed by, by my friend Yashuiza from uh, Tohoku University. And coming from this project of Walker, that means interaction, man-machine interaction between the, the robotic system, he developed this. So a dancer robotic system. And here you have all the interaction. Uh, so that means that the system, the robotic system, detect the intention. Here, it's limited because it's a, a classic dance. But there is some interaction to, to control, to analyze, intention to think, and the system what be. The last point is we. Our project, we are at the beginning. This moment is complex for me because we are in the process of industrialization, so there is some confidentiality. So I could not present to you the project. It's like a teaser. Next year, you will see it, but <laughs> sorry. But trust me, it's very nice, this project. It, it, really, it is my better project, in fact. And uh, so I can do it today because you don't see anything. So. <laughs> but you will see it because we come back next year with all the team. And uh, so, but it's important to say that we could found, finance this kind of project. And we have two sources of financement. One is coming from the university and the second is coming from the culture ministry. And they like this research. Are, uh, I think you have the same. At the beginning, it's complex, but you will see the show. In fact, the show, the first show will be 12 of December. So it's coming very soon. And the last point, maybe you know this video. So it's important to have the sound. This lady has Alzheimer. She, she is a former dancer and she hears Swan Man. And she starts to move, to have gesture. She remember when she dance. I think you know this video. It's important to understand that the stimulation, dance, do things. And it's very important to see that. And that's the idea behind my works. And to use ludic, to do games, to use music, dance, to promote, look that. Even the music is nice. I think this video is very important. And for researchers, moreover in the disabled field, it's important to do now not only mobility, but why mobility. Somewhere I, I write why, and to, de, to go to the participation. And emotion for that is very important. We have to deal to emotion. So with Etienne, we will do 
a lot of things. Just to have a, a quick mention of my project, my dancer is an expert on wheelchair. Even she is an expert when she starts the project with the robotic system I'm developing, she has a problem because now she is a beginner. So in terms of emotion, it's very important to deal with that, to include in the project all the analysis. So just to conclude my talk, first I want to thank all the colleagues who worked with me, uh, the partner from the Expert Center CRM, and of course, because I'm coming now from two, uh, 2008, when uh, Skandar Prof. Alex uh, Amam invited me in the first time. So we, we develop many collaborations between FSAT with MSE, double diploma, doctorate. It was each time important. And this time is like every time. So I'm very happy to be here and I thank everybody to invite me. Thank you again. Thank you very much to Professor Monacelli. As we convene this hybrid seminar, our next key address is going to be online on the subject of adaptive hybrid approaches for assisting walking activities of um, paretic patients. And our speaker for the subject is Professor Mohammed from Lisi Laboratory um, at UPEC. He is going to address the Sachi chair online. Over to you, Professor Mohammed. Thank you. Okay, good. I am live. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Okay, I'm just uh, just a moment to share my presentation, please. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Uh, I will just. Uh, Can you see my screen? Okay. It's okay now? Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for the kind invitation. So my name is Samir Mohamed and I'm professor at the University of Paris Est Créteil. My presentation today will be entitled Adaptive Hybrid Approaches for Assistive, Assisting Walking Activity of Paritic Patient. Uh, okay, let me introduce myself first. So I'm uh, a pro professor at the University of Paris Est Créteil, the same university of uh, our colleague uh, Karim Giovanni, who is sharing this workshop. And uh, we are working in close collaboration uh, with the hospital, Henri Mondor Hospital, which is uh, very close to our uh, university. So, um, general context and motivation of my talk today about um, about uh, the uh, the challenges around the world population aging and disability. As you may know, the proportion of uh, of people uh, of of people um, of the elderly people in the developing country is increasing uh, uh, all over the year. For example, with an uh, with the projection in 2050, more than 35 percent of the European population will be aged 60 uh, and 65 and more. This will bring uh, um, an important challenges to be uh, to be uh, faced uh, with respect to society, economic and industrial challenge. So uh, at the same time, also we have an increasing number of stroke, which is a leading uh, cause of long term disability. We have, for example, in 2016, more than 14, 14 million stroke occurred in worldwide. And uh, and uh, this will increase in the elderly and stroke uh, stroke uh, uh, causes will increase the number of elderly and age-related uh, disease at the same time. So there will be an increasing interest uh, uh, in the last decades in the healthcare technology and uh, most importantly, reha more remote rehabilitation at home because uh, I mean the system, the health system will be uh, will be quickly saturated with the increasing number and we need to to find some solutions that are uh, 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 reliable 
and uh, could be uh, could be uh, could work remotely. Uh, here in France, we have the developing important companies and startups within the, what we call the silver economy and the emergence of new economic and industrial sectors related to uh, to the assistive technologies and uh, to um, I mean to the uh, to assist this population. Now I will go back to our our specific cases and some example of the motor dis disorders that we are facing here at the hospital at the Henry Mondor Hospital, and on which we are working uh, working uh, very uh, very uh, very extensively. We have the posture movement uh, pathologies. Uh, we have uh, the cerebral palsy, uh, most importantly for the children. We have the hemiparesis after the stroke, and here on, on the video we have some example of uh, of parkinson's disease during daily activity uh, spinal cord injury nerve and muscle diseases uh, loss of of uh, of body limbs amputation joint lesion etc etc in in most of the cases we have what we call pathologies that involve at the same time sensory and motor functions this is what we call sensory motor uh, patho based pathologies so we are going to present some solution to uh, to uh, to reply to such kind of uh, of pathologies. Uh, currently, uh, and uh, in the we have the conventional therapy, okay, that is used until our days. For example, in in Harry Mondo Hospital, we have this, such kind of, uh, of, uh, of of conventional therapy, which consists of stretching the muscles uh, and connective tissues that can prevent the stiffness and spasticity of the patient. So we uh, we uh, work on more on just on the speaking and inviting the the person to do some some uh, some um, some exercises uh, to avoid some secondary effect of their pathologies we need to train their daily living activities and those exercises will provide novel somatosensory stimulation that helps those people and those population induce central nervous plasticity so the idea is to improve uh, the function patient, well-being, and their independence. Those are the conventional uh, therapy that exist uh, today and that are used. So if I want to talk from just another point of view, I mean just a control point of view or automatic point of view, scientific point of view, we have here, I just put it in the, into one scheme. So we have the central nervous system, which, which uh, gives the activations for the muscle, and the muscle will generate the force. We have the skeleton system, and when, then we have the movement generated. Then on the other side, we have the environment that will interact with the, with the human, like, for example, here walking on the ground. And also we have the sensors here. So uh, and those those information for coming from environment and our 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 sensory organs will update the central nervous system in term in in uh, in order to uh, to update the activation of the muscle and avoid, for example, if we are walking, we will avoid some obstacle. This will come from visual feedback that will adapt uh, our uh, our central nervous system, our movement, in order to avoid obstacle. The problem with with uh, with this, with this, uh, the, uh, with the patient is this information is missing. So we don't have this closed loop that we what we call at the closed loop. We have something in open loop, and then what we will try to do is we try to close this loop externally, artificially, because it's not the case naturally anymore as with healthy people. So this is another representation. We have here the, the communication between the, the central nervous system and the muscles, and we have at the motor level and the sensory level, but the problem is when we have some medullary lesion, as the case for the paratic patient, this communication is lost. This communication is lost, and we need to establish again this communication. This is why what we use, what we call the functional electrical stimulation. So we are going to stimulate artificially the muscle in order to restore the movement. And we are using some sensors, of course, in order to, uh, to know how much stimulation uh, are needed in order to restore a given movement. Of course, we are not going to replace the central nervous system. It's very complicated because simply what we can see, we can see here a scene of the muscle and the fibers that are recruited are randomly. When the central nervous system orders some contraction to the muscles, this contraction is done 
arbitrarily. It means with with an optimal uh, within an optimal uh, stimulation process. However, when it comes for the functional electric FES, is functional electric stimulation, we are going to stimulate the muscle, but this stimulation is artificial stimulation. So we are going to stimulate the fiber externally fiber first, and then at when when the stimulation intensity will increase, we are going deeper and deeper in the muscle into to stimulate uh, the fiber that are deeper. So the idea here is to that this artificial stimulation will induce, unfortunately, what we call the fatigue, because if we stimulate more and more deep, the muscle will be in tetanus situation and will not uh, respond anymore. So it's very important to know how to stimulate, because if we stimulate too much, then the muscle will be will be completely, uh, completely, uh, I mean, will not respond to our to any to any movement because it is uh, tet tetanized. So this is the conventional functional electric stimulation. And what we propose in this project that we are, I'm going to present here is what we call the adaptive functional electric stimulation. So we are going to stimulate, but not continuously. It's not on off. We are going to adapt the stimulation in order to, uh, to reduce the muscle fatigue and to uh, increase the process, the uh, rehabilitation process. Okay, so uh, and to uh, to be more close to the natural uh, st natural activity uh, of uh, the muscles. So I'm I'm presenting here some uh, a video that shows the walking of the subject. Uh, for example, here we have the walking of the subject uh, of a paratic uh, subject, and we divided this movement into two uh, two parts. We have the swing phase uh, and the stance phase. Okay. Okay. Here we uh, and the idea here is we have this is the area of angle. Uh, Average ankle dorsiflexion, the ankle dorsiflexion, uh, and our goal is to shift this area uh, uh, at least three degree in order to avoid what we call the foot drop and uh, in, and decrease the, the fall of risk, which is a very common uh, symptom of the uh, uh, population of paratic subject. Okay, so this is a prototype that we have proposed, and this uh, we have a patent uh, that has been. This project has uh, is been uh, supported, but uh, by um, a society of uh, tra uh, technology transfer here in France, and we have got uh, the fund for this project about 350 kilo euros to support this uh, project, and we have a patent that has been sub uh, that has been uh, uh, published on uh, the idea. So the idea is to to use some external sensors that will we will observe the knee joint angle because we suppose the knee is relatively uh, healthy uh, and in order to observe with respect to this knee we are going to stimulate the muscle what we call the tibialis interior muscle in order to avoid the foot drop okay so we have here is the IMU sensors that will give us uh, different information about the ankle about the about the uh, 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 the fact of being in contact of the, in the with the ground or not and so on I'm not going into uh, the detail. For example, just a small uh, here, a small uh, uh, videos that show that we are able without using the foot switch, because in general pe people use a foot switch to detect when we are in contact with the ground. Here we propose to use IMUs without using a ground reaction forces in order to not overwhelm the subject with a lot of sensors. So the idea is to use external sensor, wearable sensors that, such as IMU, very simple to use in order to detect the swing phase and the stance phase without using. Uh, the, uh, the foot switch, uh, the foot switch, which is not very convenient for subject. Okay, so here, for example, a comparison between the uh, between the effect of the of the different case. We have the FES standard F, uh, without FES, without using a stimulation. We can see here, for example, if we take a photo of the in initial contact, the hitting with the, with the ground, that the, the ankle dorsiflexion is very is very uh, very small. We have the trapezoidal or conventional, which is on off stimulation, and we can see that here we have a sufficient clear clearance at at the toe at the heel strike. And and we here we have here the adaptive functional electric stimulation. We have some comparable. If you can see here the angle when we hit the ground is comparable to this one, to the common one, and it is uh, far from what we have in without stimulation. So. This is the idea. I'm not going to, into the details. You have here the knee joint angle, and here is the, the form that we are proposing to add to stimulation. In gray part is the on-off, is the traditional one. It, it means how we stimulate in on-off, and in red, it is the adaptive one, which means that all this area will not be stimulated, which means less fatigue for the muscle. 
Okay, so the, I, the, we we have conducting uh, um, this study on about forty uh, or forty eight uh, subject. We have done uh, the uh, half of the study. We have three groups: FS, which is the adaptive functional trait stimulation. We have the placebo, and we have the vocade. Okay, vocade is a very commercial commercial system used in the in the in the uh, I mean uh, developed by an American uh, American provider, and it is uh, based on the use of on-off stimulation. And we would compare our our system with the vocade, and of course with the placebo. Uh, okay, here we have the patient. We have, for example, here five patients, uh, three patients, and the four that started. And uh, here we have uh, five patients in the walk aid because uh, I mean the, we have chosen ar arbitrarily. It's random, randomized uh, study. Okay, the protocol is we have the day one. We have evaluation study of the subject. We will invite the subject to come and we'll analyze at, as the dorsiflexion, the ankle dorsiflexion, the, the subject ability to walk, and then. We will have from week one to week 12, 45 minute session, three times per week. The, the subject will come and will put the system and the, we, we, he will be part of the three groups and he will uh, walk uh, for 45 minutes with the system. Okay, with the st system stimulating if it is FS or walk aid and uh, placebo. So we don't have any stimulation in this case. Then we will make in week 12 another evaluation similar to the first one and uh, between week 12 and week 24, there's no session. And then, and then at week 24, we are going to make an evaluation again because uh, in order to see if there is any rehabilitative uh, effect of uh, the use of the stimulation. Okay. So uh, this, are, this is the subject uh, using with the knee angle. I mean here, swing detection and the FS that we are proposing here, and we can see clearly uh, the effect of the FES uh, uh, of the FS on the knee. Some uh, uh, some result very quickly. Uh, preliminary result because we have only half of the subject. We have, for example, here day one, week 12, and uh, and the week 24. And in terms of angle dorsiflexion, we can see that there's some increase. We have two kind of experiment: barefoot or shoes. And most importantly is the energy consumption because here, with respect to conventional one, we have about 20 percent of less of energy consumption, which is, which means 20% less of muscular fatigue during the process of 45 minutes. Uh, this is a complete uh, uh, diagram of the of the result. I will not present just very, 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 uh, very shortly. We have the barefoot, we have the shoes. And here we can see that we are obtaining about four degrees, which is four, which is more than the three degrees that we have uh, uh, made it at the beginning. And uh, we can see that, uh, of course, with the walk aid we obtain more. But the problem is that uh, the energy consumption here, when we use the FS, we gain uh, about 20% of consumption less, which is not the case of uh, the walk aid. So we have comparable. Uh, comparable result with the AFS uh, with the with the walk aid. Of course, in the placebo case, there will since there's no simulation, so the, there will not be any improvement in the ankle dorsiflexion. But here uh, we can see that it is similar, and at the same time we are gaining at the energy consumption because we are stimulating less than the less than the walk aid or the conventional stimulation process. Another project, very quickly, uh, because I think I'm running out of time, uh, is the use of um, uh, external orthosis. So here, for example, instead of using functional electric stimulation, what we will use is uh, what we call an actuated ankle foot orthosis. And it, it is an orthosis that is actuated at uh, the ankle joint level, and the idea is all was also to improve the ankle dorsiflexion during walking in order to avoid the foot drop and the, and decrease the uh, the risk falls of the of the of the subject of course we are using all the sensors that i have cited before and the combination of this sensor in order to uh, to assess the the status of the subject during the walking Okay, of course, I will not go into, into, don't be afraid, I will not go into the mathematical formulation. Just to let you know that the controllers that we have proposed is an, it's an ad adaptive uh, controller because there will be many subjects using the system. And this, since we are developing some model based controllers, so we, we need to identify the parameter of the subject each time. So, what we did here is to propose some adaptive controllers that avoid ad uh, calibre, I mean, uh, identification of the, uh, of the parameter for each time and for each 
profile for each patient. All what we need is that just doing some calibration at the beginning and some walking for certain number for certain time on the treadmill, and then the system is completely operational to be used with the subject uh, that is uh, wearing the who is wearing the the system. Okay, just a small video here uh, to show you the, the system. So this is adaptive. Uh, uh, this is some result uh, that, uh, okay, adaptive. Refer I would not go into the detail, but we have generated some reference trajectory, which is tailored to the subject, to the patient. We can see this, uh, the subject here walking, walking on the treadmill. It is uh, here in this case, it, we started with a healthy subject, healthy subject walking on the treadmill. We detect the different sub phase of the swing phase and distance phase. We, we generate the ankle dorsiflexion and then we develop the torque of course the torque that will be applied to uh, to help the subject and then we have also some clinical trial with the real patient and here um, some preliminary result with uh, with patient at Henri Mondor and we have did different session with the subject uh, walking on the treadmill and uh, here we can see uh, the the subject uh, wearing the the prototype and uh, and the prototype is providing some help we can see here the reference trajectory and uh, the current trajectory of course we will not uh, co fully compensate for the for the movement i mean of the subject will, because it's impossible to do during uh, due to the uh, to some uh, to some spasticity of the of the muscles but and the stiffness of the of the joint and the muscles, but we are getting closer. And we, as we, I, I will show in the in the following, we can see that uh, we have some very important improvement in uh, the result. So uh, okay, then this uh, is similar for uh, for the subject. And then I will show here for just the last graph, we have. Uh, uh, the stance phase when loading response roll over and push off and finally the swing phase we have different sessions non-assisted session non-assisted session and three assisted session and we can see that uh, uh, in terms of mean angle joint error we uh, i mean we uh, in the case of the assistive we decrease the error between the desired trajectory and the current trajectory uh, for the different assistive trajectory for the different uh, situation at uh, the loading response which is the initial contact or roll over mid uh, it mean mid stance push off which is the late stance and finally uh, the swing phase we can see in all the cases yeah this is uh, the end and thank you for uh, thank you for your attention Thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Mohammed. Before I call upon our next uh, speaker, I just want to kindly make a request to the speakers to please keep to your time that has been allocated for your session so that we can uh, run the program timelessly. I just want to kindly make that request to the uh, speakers that will come to the fore that you please stick to your time. Thank you so much. Um, the next address to the Saatchi chair um, is on the subject of uh, machine learning in chemistry and material sciences. And uh, if we, uh, the speaker will also be joining us online. So um, I'd like to ask us, ladies and gentlemen, to please welcome Professor Jean-Claude Quivello from UPEC. Uh, Professor Quivello, over to you. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, just give us a moment, some technical glitch that we're experiencing.
Ladies and gentlemen, we continue with the program. Um, I'd like to call the next speaker who's going to address the Sachi Chair on the subject of Li-Fi studies on an example for, labor for laboratory to start a process. Um, help me welcome Professor Shashan from LS LISV Laboratory from uh, University of Paris, Saclay. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, the presentation will presume shortly as we are um, getting it ready. Please bear with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, hello everybody. So I'm very pleased to be there. Uh, it's a pleasure. Special thanks to the organizing uh, crew. Special thanks to Anish and Karim. Uh, so I'm Luc Chassang from the LISV. So I think Eric presents already the LISV. So I won't be uh, anymore. I'm going from the University of Paris-Saclay. I'm the director of LISV Laboratory, and I'm also the vice director of Graduate School of Engineering in Paris-Saclay that Bernard Yanou uh, uh, presented uh, yesterday. Uh, so I will present uh, communication topics about visible light communication, or the second acronym is LIFI. OK, so first, yeah, it's OK. Yeah, OK, thank you. So first, what is LIFI? You, you will see two, two different acronyms. LIFI, which is uh, invented by Aras in 2011, which means light Wi-Fi, but with light. Or you will see also visible light communication, VLC. So more or less, it is optical communication. You put a LED. I put a red LED, but uh, whatever uh, color is, it is not important. And it is digital communication, like you can find in fiber optics communication, it's the same. 
but the source is, is a LED. So it could be the LED on the roof. Uh, it's not LED on the top, but uh, in in few years, there will be LED everywhere, of course. So you transmit digital information. You have an emitter, a receiver with opticals, uh, lens, and so on to, to, uh, to, to receive the, the message. So, of course, the LED is blinking so high that you can see it for human uh, eyes. Uh, so it's the general uh, principle of Li-Fi. So why Li-Fi? It was born in the two, around 2000. In the lab, we begin in 2007. And uh, there is many advantages. And I didn't put the drawbacks. It doesn't interest me the drawbacks. So only the advantages. Um, advantages of LEDs are plenty. Uh, it's reliable, very efficient in, in terms of energy. It's low cost, uh, long life, LC, and so, and so many. The advantage of, the, of light, you know it. It's, you can modulate the light very at very high uh, uh, speeds. Of course, the, the, the light is not faster than radio frequency, but you can modulate very quickly. So I put some figures just to, to, to see some uh, or the order of magnitude. If you have a wi classical Wi-Fi com communication, uh, roughly you will, be, you will have 15 to 100 uh, megabytes per second. It depends if you are lucky. But uh, uh, in Wi-Fi, the record has been demonstrated at two, uh, 200, um, more than 200 gigabytes per second. So many, many information compared to Wi-Fi. It's a big advantage of uh, visible light. You can modulate the, the, the light higher. Uh, so it's potential, uh, very, very interesting. Uh, yeah, okay. So, oh, sorry, uh, rear, back. Yeah. So, for example, some um, potential application. Uh, it could be very inter interesting in uh, sensitive environments like hospitals because you uh, you do not use radio frequency. That in hospitals the environment could be a, a problem uh, because you use light. Uh, there was uh, some prototype that uh, showed uh, the experiment in supermarkets because you have LED everywhere, uh, in museum, in parking. And uh, in parking or supermarket, uh, one of the advantages of the, of the Li-Fi is that you could uh, add also geolocalization indoor. Because if the LED send an ID, I know exactly where I am. So uh, the geolocalization with Li-Fi uh, show uh, in, the, in the best prototypes a geolocalization at the centimeter. So it's better than the Wi-Fi. With the Wi-Fi, uh, maybe you have one meter, less than one meter. Uh, Li-Fi is more precise. One of the main advantages also of the Li-Fi is that it's highly secured. If you have no window, uh, you cannot, uh, something, someone cannot uh, catch the information if, it's, if he's you know, outside of the room. So for military services, it's a very uh, impressive advantage. Uh, of course, it's also a drawback because what you can see, uh, you can broadcast. But in this case, it's mostly an advantage. And I, I put also two, uh, two others uh, photo just to imagine. Uh, I speak about LED, but you have also uh, organic LED that are more uh, flexible. And you can imagine that it could be a source also. And you, you, you I, I guess in the future you have uh, designed, uh, highly designed uh, LED or uh, everywhere, um, maybe on my on my pen, on my brush tools, I don't know. Uh, and the second advantage is that you can use also photovoltaic, photovoltaic cells to uh, as a uh, receiver, and you, you can couple the two functions, uh, energy and information. Uh, so two examples of a more precise uh, utilization of the Li-Fi. It's in the automotive field. We, in the lab, we work a lot in the automotive field. So it's an example of platooning. So platoon is uh, very simple. The first car is autonomous or will be autonomous for presently there is a driver. And after that, you can have several uh, cars that are uh, in a platoon and that are semi-autonomous or autonomous in the, in the futures. So the interest of li is that is that you have a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, communication. So it's very hard to hack, of, of course, and the, the problematic of hacking is uh, important in the futures. 
And second advantage, uh, you know that future 5G uh, promotes the, the low latency, and it is very important in the automotive uh, uh, field because the latency is uh, it's compulsory to have uh, to send security messages. So uh, the, the, the platoon is a good example of direct link with Li-Fi with uh, more software protocols. Uh, so I, I will begin to, to ask, uh, to, to show the, the, the startup Oletcom. Uh, the, okay. A second application is in airplane situation. So it was not a uh, uh, work of the uh, LISV, but more of Oletcom. And Latequer, Latequer is an airplane company in France. They, they make a prototype in uh, 2019 that has been shown in a brochure that is a big uh, showroom of uh, for planes in France. And uh, the, the, the advantage of fly fi in planes is that you can uh, avoid the cables, so you can uh, lower the, the weight. So it's a very important problematic in airplanes. Uh, and of course, you can have very uh, data rates. So in this, in this case of prototype, it was for to show that you can uh, you can uh, use Li-Fi to, to to provide a video or whatever on the, on the plane. Uh, but of course, it is not commercialized yet. Uh, so third and last example, there is many many research for indoor uh, situation. So I just put two graphs to to show you that there is plenty of. Uh, of uh, research in every topics. So, uh, so some people try to higher the data rate. Some people try to enhance the spectral efficiency, the power efficiency. There's plenty of uh, research about uh, different sources. So LED, uh, micro LED that has a very small LED, uh, OLE, organic uh, LED and so on. Um, there is plenty of research about detectors, the range and, and so on. And an important topic also, uh, maybe the Li-Fi will be integrated in 6G, not in 5G, but uh, the problematic of underwear between technology, uh, radio frequency and technology and uh, optical technology is very important also. So uh, it's just a state of the art that show you that there is plenty of research that try to, to, to enhance every parameters. And uh, in the lab, we mainly work on spectral efficiency. So uh, in 2012, uh, uh, two professors, uh, Suat Topsi and Cedric Meyer, found OLEDCOM, that, was, that is a startup uh, found by, by the lab. Um, so it's, it's a startup that is in good health, so it's a good point. Um, and there is an agreement between OLEDCOM and the LISV. Uh, the, la the lab is exploring the, the Li-Fi or the, the topics of Li-Fi for the future. There is plenty of uh, joint action. Uh, we, we answer to uh, government calls or something like that. There is an agreement, of course. In uh, 2018 and 2019, we organized the first uh, international global Li-Fi Congress that was in Paris. And the community of Li-Fi in the world is maybe, I, I don't know, maybe 500 or 1,000. Uh, OK. And of course, OLEDCOM is now a startup. She, she, they are free. Uh, they are not. Uh, we are. We, we are. Um, we communicate uh, each day with them because they, they are in the same building that the life file. And just to show you the progress that they, they did in few years, in ten years, uh, in the, the first generation of um, microchip integrate uh, that integrate the life file is, is for this year or next years. Uh, you can see uh, the first prototype of. Uh, integrated uh, Li-Fi uh, chip. Uh, you can see that it is quite small. Uh, there's an ASICS, the photodiodes, and the sources that is, that is a laser. And you can see uh, by the scale that is very, uh, very integrated. And uh, now OLEDCOM is the, is the one of the third uh, leaders in the world about Li-Fi. There is two other leaders that are, uh, that are poor Li-Fi that uh, is in UK and signify that is a consortium. Um, so the, the market of Li-Fi is slowly growing, uh, so very slowly, but it will uh, grow and grow, I think. Um, today, OLEDCOM is mainly uh, focused on, uh, 
on three targets uh, the education so it's a, on the right it's a commercial of Oletcom there's a happy uh, little girl because the in the schools um, the the the, um, the problematic of uh, radio frequency could be uh, uh, very uh, interesting to say that, oh we do we don't want radio frequency for the young child uh, light is better for health okay so they sell in uh, in schools on uh, and so on in hospitals and recently, Oletcom won uh, the Euro, uh, European call uh, that is called uh, ERC uh, because they plan to to integrate Li-Fi in space satellite. I, I don't remember if it is a nano satellite or micro satellite. And the aim is that the same uh, for that for airplane, uh, you have less cable, so very interesting for for the for the weight. And second advantage that is very important also. In satellite, I guess you know uh, the, the complexity to, to to be sure that the cables are well done, and uh, it's a very uh, complex process. And if you uh, withdraw the, the cables, uh, the process is easier. Um, and of course, they also, they also sell some uh, some prototype for indoor um, indoor situation. Now, the commercial version that you can find for uh, for Li-Fi. Uh, in OLEDCOM other uh, company is around one gigabyte per second uh, in terms of uh, boundaries. Okay, I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Chachagne. Um, we are going to go back to Professor Jean-Claude um, Crivello who is joining us online on the subject of machine learning in chemistry and material sciences. Over to you, Professor. Let's welcome him once again to the platform. Technical problems. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, Professor. Thank you. Okay, please. So my name is Jean-Claude Crivello and I'm a CNRS researcher. So I'm doing much more fundamental research. And today I will speak about machine learning applied to chemistry and material science. So I will not speak only about my research, but much give you a kind of overview of all kind of application we have now. So you are of course aware that AA booming in many applications. So it's prevalent in many fields and obviously in chemistry. Uh, if you see the global private investment recently in purple for 2020, uh, you can see that all kind of research related to chemistry as molecular or drug discovery is really much more improved. Obviously, it's also because about the, the COVID situation, but also because now the, the, the research in chemistry is mature enough for doing ma uh, machine learning on it. In fact, it's a real revolution which is starting. If you look at the chemistry in the, in the history, we have a well-known free paradigms, the empirical science, uh, making by uh, own empirical uh, testing. Then we have start in the middle of the 17th century to, to build some model to analyze what we can observe. And uh, since um, 100 years, uh, let's say, that uh, using computer, you can have um, an assist calculations to, to help you to drive your research. But now, since we have now machine learning, we have many databases, we can have a kind of driven science made from that. And uh, it's not only a dream, because re research in, in, in industry also is dream, is, is thinking that all kind of material discovery is starting to change using this kind of algorithm. And uh, why it's possible now? Because we have access to all to a supercomputer, so you can grab a lot, a lot of data. Uh, as an example, the US has built a, a large genome uh, in database, uh, which we call Material Genome Initiatives, uh, where we grab a lot of data, make starting from DFT calculations or experimental data, and they build, as you can see in this review of Nature, uh, many, many um, databases that could be now used for doing machine learning to predict any data as, for example, uh, heat of formation or any, any kind of properties. So from now, I will speak about the several approach which can be, which are used 
in the in the literature. So there's, as you know, in artificial intelligence, many kind of approach. The first one that you can know it's it's data mining algorithm. We have a lot of data, and from this data, you can pick some data to make some correlation informations. So I just give you an illustration for that. For example, uh, here it's the mechanical properties. Uh, so you know a lot of mechanical properties of many alloys and you can make some alloy design by making a kind of combinatory analysis of these of this alloys, for example. The second well-known approach in data science is all the algorithms related to optimizations as, for example, the, the genetic algorithm. So you have a database of many alloys. Alloys means compositions with elements. So you put two, two, two individuals, you, you, two parents, you can reproduce and to build a children by mixing their gene. Here the gene is the, popular, is the properties of a, the alloys. And if the children is better than the parents, you can keep it or not. And like this, you can make a kind of a material design by using this kind of optimization algorithm. So it's also very well used now in, 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 in the literature. And uh, which is also very booming now, it's all the machine learning algorithm and especially the supervised learning because we have now a lot of database and from this database, you can make any predictions. So I think you, you know this kind of algorithm, you have a database and you are building a prediction functions since if you have a new, um, comp a new uh, uh, value, you can make a prediction of a target value in the target value is a quantitative value. As you know, it's a regression. And if it's a qualitative, it's a classification. So let's let's see some examples. So if the target value you want to predict is quantitative one, it's a regression. So you, you have many algorithms of regression, as you know. It's used since more than 10 years now by special physicists. We're making some kind of prediction of properties. Here is an example of uh, heat of formation, which is the energy to form compounds from database of uh, DFT calculations. This is very interesting to, to, to estimate the heat of formation of a compound, for example. Uh, don't have time for that. Let's see the classification algorithm. It's particularly interesting to, to know in advance if a compound, for example, could be um, synthesized in a kind of um, compounds that will have uh, uh, functional properties. For example, here it's an example of thermoelectric compounds. It's a kind of compounds that can um, produce electricity from it. And um, from a database, you can build a kind of uh, decision tree, but in many kind of classification algorithms can help you to produce and to, um, to predict a new kind of compounds with a a specific um, functions. Uh, much more complex algorithms, like random forest is obviously used. And um, okay, we'll probably not have time for that, but it's specially used for, for material design in terms of a classification algorithms in order to, to looking for specific functional properties. Okay, uh, it's also used to support, for example, um, microscopy, which is not abuse to identify some kind of phases. So if you have a phases with some learning properties, or if, for example, the, the kind of, uh, of um, the identification of kind of phase in a, in a iron alloys, but you can use it automatically to identify here the matter science structures. So this is quite used now. Uh, and the artificial neuron is much more, of course, the, uh, the neural network is now very well used to many applications. So you know that this kind of algorithm is used especially to, to, for image, but it's also used for much more complex properties. Like here, for example, it's a spectra of absorption spectra from um, synchrotron. It's used specifically to identify the local environment of, of atoms. It's quite well difficult, in fact, to 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 analyze in deeper and deeper. So uh, the fact is now it's automatically uh, analyzed from a learning database, and you can identify the environment of atoms by using this kind of neural network. There are much more global methods which are now used. It's a very impressive one. 
uh, it's making your literature survey. You know, when you are doing research, you want to make a literature survey to looking for what is the previous uh, papers on the topic. And now this kind of topic, this kind of research is building many um, things like a neural network, uh, natural language processing to look to, to pick up some words and to understand which is the synthesis methods which is better to 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 use to to for making a new compounds so this kind of approach is, is really really impressive i think so i'm speaking a lot about discretive methods like predictive methods but now the new fashion is the generative methods which is a, a well known use starting to be used it's especially uh, for chemistry because chemistry is quite easy because a molecule can be written by a kind of, um, of um, representation by a chain of characters. So this is quite easy, for example, to use all the, the knowledge from natural logic processing to write not a sentence here, but a molecules. And from that, it's possible to generate a lot of molecules, of, of, of uh, words, but of, of molecules, in order to, to, to have a uh, molecules for specific functions, which is, for example, here in, in, on right, an example which is quite interesting using uh, um, uh, via a uh, uh, encoder. Uh, it's a kind of generative uh, approach where, in this latent space, you can try to looking for uh, molecules in uh, specific functions. And if you get it, you can produce the new molecules. And all of that is only a chain of characters. So this is quite interesting. And now that is why a lot of investments are doing on this field now, because it's quite easy to, to, to do now. Uh, it's also used to generate new structure. This is my last example. So for storage hydrogen uh, as a hydrogen as an energy carrier, you need to store it. And uh, metal hydride is one of kind of uh, interesting compounds, but you have to find new compounds. To discover new compounds, you can build, for example, um, you can mix metals, so A and B, to produce uh, AB alloys. And uh, this is, can be used for using GAN, a generative adversarial network uh, generative approach. And uh, this is quite interesting. You can produce like this many new structure by combining properties of other of, of compounds. So this is my conclusions. So I just give you an overview of what machine learning is now applied to chemistry and material science. You just have to take a message. There's many applications now. It's really booming. We are, as you can, as I wrote in, in here, we are in the golden age of all the discriminative approach to predict properties. Uh, and now I think we have a new a new field is op opening. Now it's all the generative approach to generate new compounds, to discover new alloys, to making no driven data compounds. And um, I think it's really interesting and very stimulating now. Okay, I finished. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Crivella. At this stage in the program, I'd like to call upon Professor Shenzhen Du from Electrical Engineering, the Tony University of Technology. He will address the Sachi Chair on the subject of human machine collaborative systems challenges and opportunities. Over to you, um, Professor Du. Hmm? Oh, is it online? Okay. <laughs> My humble apologies. Um, let's welcome him online. Professor Du, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, colleagues and the guests from the front side. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for your attention, for the share of the ideas. And uh, uh, secondly, uh, my, my apologies, apologies to cannot uh, present uh, in, in the conference because of the online uh, classes before and after my presentation. Uh, today, uh, what I want to uh, present is the human machine collaborative system challenges and the opportunities. Uh, I won't uh, focus on the applications. Uh, but I use some applications to show some uh, interesting ideas and some uh, critical thinking. <clears throat> so, so firstly, uh, it is uh, 
Technology, technology development, development determines the role of human in production. So, you know, from a very early of the history of the human uh, civilization, uh, the human is a part of the production. At the beginning, we, we are used, we were used as the power sources. So at that time, we have to use our contribution as the source of the power. That is before the first uh, industrial revolution. And after the first uh, industrial revolution, the mechanical powers, they take over from the human uh, power. And then the human becomes uh, less important. That becomes the, 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 the simple decision maker, mainly to operate the uh, mechanism systems. And in the, after the second industrial revolution, we get more advanced uh, mechanical and electrical systems. So at that time, we have the massive production and the human being becomes the operator again, but that operator is, it becomes more and more less important. Until the third industrial revolution, we have the autonomous production. There, the human being becomes the, the human becomes the designer, not directly included in the production loop. So, but the, with the fourth industrial revolution coming, we as the intelligent, the highest intelligent animal or the object or the most smart tools, we come back to the production as the collaborative intelligence with the mechanical or the robot systems. And the human machine collaborative systems is really comes uh, after the, what, the fourth industrial revolution, mostly because of the uh, supporting techniques get advanced development. Now we get more and more capacities to welcome a human back to the production directly. Obviously, there are a lot of benefits for this movement. Firstly, we have some uh, very interesting applications that, that can be considered as the human machine collaborative systems. For example, the mixed uh, reality, the haptic hearing substitution, the BCI, etc. I will use uh, some of these applications as example to show the benefit of the human machine systems. Firstly, for the teleoperation systems, this system, the human operator can stay in a very safe and comfortable workstation to control the robot in the uh, very uh, high, very hazard working environment. So in this way, we can avoid a lot of uh, hurt to the human operators. A mixed reality uh, systems, besides of the removing the people from the hazard working environment, this system have a big contribution for the simulation for training. So that means when we train the workers, we do not necessarily to put them in the uh, in, in the uh, uncomfortable environment we can use the the mixed reality environment to design a lot of incidents to uh, simulate the real world situation to teach the or train the human workers to get used and to know how to operate according to different incidents so that that is a very uh, big value for the industry. It can mimic a lot of uh, a lot of scenarios for the uh, human worker to deal with. Also, make sure the human worker is safe, and the and the cost is also low. And the collaborative robots. These robots uh, is uh, what uh, we have in the Germany. Uh, we have the collaborative uh, uh, students that side. So this uh, collaborative robot is designed to working 
in the human uh, environment. So that means the human and the robot will work in the same environment. So the, the robot can detect the presence of uh, the human and they know how to collaborate and how to avoid the clash to the uh, human uh, workers. So this one, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a just a prototype. And for the uh, brain computer interface, uh, now we not only uh, assist the normal people, but for some uh, people uh, suffered from some uh, diseases, we can use the EEG signal taken from the, the scalp to, con to control the external devices. So that will uh, unlock them from the uh, disabled. So this is mainly used in the assistive living environment. And we uh, newly, operate, we newly open, opened a uh, very interesting research that is a haptic hearing uh, substitution. So this one, we, 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 we are aiming to assist the deaf, so the people cannot hear, uh, for them to hear via the skin. So we are, we are encoding the language, the, pronounce, the, the voice to the uh, vibration, stimul the stimulation to the skin using the haptic uh, motors. So the disabled not only can uh, hear what uh, other people are talking, they also can uh, enjoy the music via this uh, uh, vibration of, uh, of, the, of the motors. So that is uh, collaborated with one of our uh, China uh, collaborator. We have the biggest uh, deaf school uh, in China. And uh, this is the uh, haptic uh, feedback operation system. This system is, uh, is uh, aims to uh, make the whole body involvement of the operator. So we not only rely on the vision, we also can make use of the haptic, the hearing, uh, et cetera, et cetera, to collaborate or to interact with the external uh, devices. It's, it's just a, a, a general idea. This application can be developed to different uh, usage, such as the uh, telecom uh, surgery or the mining, uh, remote mining, etc. So obviously, there are a lot of benefits for the human machine systems if they are uh, applied in the real world. And also, there are quite a few uh, challenges of the human machine collaborative systems. The biggest uh, difficulty of the human machine systems is the human and the machine. They are heterogeneous factors. So from the traditional uh, mechanical electrical systems, you know all the components. They are either mechanical or uh, electrical or chemical, etc. But do not have the human being involved in the system. Now we are trying to, to integrate the human in the human machine systems. So we must know about the basic fact that the basic differences between the human and the other factors of the system. For example, the human being, we have strong intelligence, but we have very weak mechanical performance if we compare with other factors. So that means we respond slower than the uh, mechanical or the uh, electrical systems, and we also have less power comparing to these other components. But our intelligence is much higher than these very simple systems. So that is also why before the industry 4.0, it, it, it was very hard to integrate the human intelligence into the production directly. And the secondly is the human brain have the comprehensive perception capacity. We are not relying on a single sensing channel. In fact, 
we are we are comprehensively combine all the possible information that we can perceive from the environment and make our decision. This one is totally different to the traditional uh, systems. So that is also a very uh, big difference. And also we have the uncertainties. For the mechanical system, if you send a command, it will respond as we in a predictable way. But for the human, the response sometimes is not reliable and sometimes might not respond in time or properly. So these, all of these uncertainties bring uh, the difficulties to the human machine systems. Also, we are not a single uh, function body. Human being is a multiple, has a multiple coupled functions. We not only can see, can do, can hear something. We can think, we can do a lot of things not belong to the uh, current function that is currently running. So that means in any human machine systems, we must have to consider the human factor in the way that the human might think in something else. So to integrate the human in the uh, machine system or in a human machine system, it is a systematic engineering problem. It's not only to, uh, to fulfill the functionalities, but also we must have the systematic performance on the reliability, the robustness, the time domain response, and how the human is experiencing in the human machine systems. So th this closed loop system is more advanced than the original human is using tools, that system. Human using tools system, that is the human have to get used to the tool. Now, the new human machine systems, the tool have to get used to the human as well. So the tools should also understand what the human want and what is the situation of the human or the parameters of the human. So that this brings us a lot of difficulties in the uh, quantitize the human data, sensing the human data, et cetera, et cetera. These things is, is, is definitely different to the traditional sensing techniques. So that bring the problems. But any problems that are solvable, the control system synthesis sees a uh, light on the reliable and the seamless human machine systems. Started using the feedback control from the 300 BC in that water uh, clock, the control systems already come to the basic philosophy of the human thinking. So in the first industrial in, uh, revolution, we know the control systems theory. We de developed the theory greatly. That is the classical uh, control theory. After that, in the second industry revolution, it it's take the, 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 the advantage of the control systems to make the system more reliable. And then in the third industry revolution, the control systems was integrated into the computer systems. It bring us the massive production process. And in the fourth industry revolution, the control systems must be embedded to the intelligence such as the AI and the other advanced techniques to continue contribute to the production with the human intelligence integrity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Professor Du. Um, at this point, we're going to take a break. Um, on my time, it's 11 o'clock on the dot. 
So I would like us to take a 10 minutes break and we will resume the program at 11.10, 10 past 11. Thank you so much to those that are joining us online. Do take a screen break, stretch your legs and grab yourself a coffee. To us here, please also um, take um, do get yourself some um, refreshments as well as also to get a leg stretch. Thank you so much.
Okay. Moi, dans ma tête, je dis au bout d'une année, c'est sûr qu'on Oui, non, mais. Oui, oui, je laisse la mienne à démarche. Ce que j'ai mis en gris, il y a un peu de temps. 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 On a réagi en 2018. 2018. Et, 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 2019, on est sur un autre, un autre résultat, donc on les verra en septembre. On va attendre. Si, si, voir, ouais, si tu peux conclure. Un peu. La puissance a trouvé. Tu veux tu veux faire un petit peu. Parce que cette année, c'est pas le PNL. Hein, on est en charge de la conception. Après, moi, je peux le réduire. Je pense que vous avez dit que les deux. Ouais, c'est ça. Il y a des deux versions à ce moment-là. Ouais, il y a la même. Je mets dans la même. Ah ouais, donc je vais mettre un sur cours. Non, non, je mettrai des titres. Non, mais c'est pas juste. Enfin, je réduis le nombre de mesures. Je laisse des titres avec le réseau. Non, mais parce que, en général, si on m'a présenté une dernière photo de la démarche, il y a je prends deux planches, tu juste après la démarche. Moi, dans ma tête, je dis au bout d'une année, c'est sûr qu'on Oui, non, mais. Oui, oui, je suis d'accord. 
Après, moi, je peux les deux. Je pense que les deux. Nice. Good morning, I can hear you indeed. Can you hear me? Good morning, I can hear you indeed. Good morning, I can hear you indeed. Can you hear me? Perfect. And you can, you can clearly see me, correct? Perfect. I'm I'm not going to do a a a a, a PowerPoint. I've actually got the physical unit here with me so that people can see it while I while I wait and and take them through it. Okay. No problem at all.
um, to the such a chair in um, enabled environment and assistive living, uh, assistive living research and innovation seminar. We are continuing with the program. Um, our next uh, speaker to address the Saatchi Chair on the subject of investigation of human robot interaction application to upper limb exoskeletons is Professor Benali from LISV Laboratory from um, uh, University of Paris, Sacré. Over to you, Professor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, and also for the, this organization. Thank you guys for your help during uh, the break. In order to help me to uh, prepare my presentation, which is, uh, which is on the topic of uh, which is on the topic of using robotic systems in industrial applications. And in the same time, I would like to thank Professor Du and uh, Professor Mohamed that uh, introduced my, my subject before my presentation now, because uh, th this presentation is, uh, is like a trend or, or, or a reflection about how we can introduce the, uh, the robotic evaluation inside the an, an industrial application so as we as as it was um, presented before the industry followed many revolutions the first one is uh, the latest which is now not uh, entirely growing so many researchers and many uh, in technological uh, prospect prospectors think that the fifth revolution has has to take into account the human intelligence inside and on the loop so first thing is to try to know what are the benefits of the fourth revolution for the companies so the first thing to uh, to analyze concerns the use of uh, internet of objects to have many sensors and to and to monitor systems if you monitor systems you can reduce the cost because you can anticipate uh, uh, breakdown of the, the, the machines and do some predictive maintenance you can also uh, improve the quality of the products in the quality of the products you can see for example the use of uh, monitoring systems or specific sensors in order to have a permanent look on the process control and on the process progress uh, progression in order to improve the quality of the projects and to reduce and improve time of production. And for some researchers, it could be also an, uh, a possibility or an ability to let uh, elderly persons continuing to work in uh, such a systems in, in industry. So our problem, position problem, it will be how to transform uh, manual tasks into collaborative ones. And in the same time, try to analyze and assess the potential use of these collaborative uh, systems to, to have your system working correctly. And lastly, try to adapt optimized tasks allocation by taking into account the human dexterity. For robotic systems uh, in industry, the robot followed many developments. Uh, the robot begins to be entirely separated and put inside the cage in, in the companies through uh, applications where the, the robot, now we try to have robot synchronized I will try to show it with, with the mouse, but it moves very quickly, this one. So the, the robot shares the same uh, workspace of the human and the operation still to be sequential. And the objective 
is the last one where we try by using more sensors to have a, a direct contact or physical contact between the human and the robot with the objectives of collaboration. Something to say about task allocation. There is um, a server with a software that tries to optimize the different tasks and try to have allocation for different tasks in order to have uh, a transformation of the raw product, raw material, until the final product. So what we try to do is to study different tasks in order to know how are the uh, main operations that we have. And we used as a first approach uh, robotic techniques in order to have an idea about dexterity, about dexterity of the robot and the dexterity of the human. These parameters are related to the humans in terms of uh, muscle activities and uh, forces used. Uh, Professor Mohamed uh, talked about the fatigue. So if it is possible to have an estimation of these fatigues in terms of maximum forces used, it will be possible to have the, the correct allocation sent or uh, allocated to the human. The same for, for the robot where the intelligence is enough to take, for example, small object, it will be possible to have this allocation uh, going to the manipulator, the robot manipulator. As uh, main objectives in terms of optimization, so here we need AI techniques, uh, heuristics, in order to make a right decision with many function objectives, for example, classical objectives are related mainly about time, uh, execution, and we can imagine that it could be possible also to include dexterity index, indexes and poster parameters in order to avoid that the, some tasks, some uh, difficult tasks to be allocated to the human. So our work is uh, now uh, beginning, so we we tried to, to talk about first the use of techniques known uh, or developed, developed in exoskeleton collaboration study uh, conducted in the LISV lab with the ISTA interface well known by the members of the, the LISV and some, some people here used it. Uh, thank you, Eric, for, for this uh, sharing. And uh, this interface is used only on use case in order to have a robotic system that could be estimated because it's a, a robotic platform. This pl robotic platform is opened. So it would be possible, for example, to imagine a technique to tune the uh, control parameters from the knowledge of the human posture. For example, we used it in order to estimate the impedance parameters of the elbow joint in order to modify the control parameters of uh, this interface. So uh, time is, go is going. So uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the system was uh, transformed in model in order to take into account the musculoskeletal model. This musculoskeletal model was, was introduced by means of uh, functions embedded functions in, in, inside specific software where the model of human, uh, human was introduced. And after that, it would be possible to execute some uh, algorithms, algorithms that could be modified here in order to obtain muscle activities, uh, uh, standard parameters that can uh, modelize the, the joint between the mix between muscles and the, the movement. And from that, we can obtain some parameters that could be used for uh, optimization inside the optimization algorithm in order to allow and facilitate the task allocation. So we conducted some, uh, we conducted some experiments where the simple task 
asked was this one. Ah, oh, it works. Where, where the user asked to have a simple pointing task. Pointing task is simple to modelize in terms of muscle activities and muscle triggering uh, orders uh, that could be uh, anticipated and known okay. if we have specific sensors that could be used to measure some to, to be uh, measured by external sensors. From this point of view, uh, estimation algorithms was uh, executed that showed here at the top of this uh, slide that there is uh, good results, good, good following between, good estimation between the experimental and the predictive simulation where the model executed inside the software was uh, run again and we can consider if we obtain a good uh, correlation between experience and uh, predictive uh, predictive calculation that the model inside our software is correct then we can take from this simulation the parameters that cannot be measured directly so here we try to do an ind indirect estimation in order to have some parameters that could be uh, for example, introduced in the, the, the optimization. So some uh, EMG sensors was uh, used, and here we see that the curves, for example, for, uh, uh, for the, this muscle activity, so here, voila, uh, we have uh, a good a good estimation obtained with these different different muscles. So from this result, it, it was possible for us to consider that our model was correct. And from that, we proposed, we proposed uh, an optimization. This optimization gives, gives us uh, some parameters that could be uh, inserted in our task allocation. So this was the first step of the study. The second one concerns the industrial process. So for this industrial process, we used a use case um, developed in the lab Lineac, which is uh, which belongs to uh, CESI, uh, a center of um, uh, teaching and research in uh, the west uh, of uh, France, at Rouen. And for this use case, we took a process which was decomposed with main tasks. Here we have four tax, tasks where the objective is to, the objective is to uh, uh, build a bicycle. So to do this, bicycle we need first to gather some parts which is the task one then we need to fix a part of the a part of this of this process so here i can show you only few seconds Up. so here we have we have the process we have the the man working on, on on it and we see that we need he needs to pick and place some objects here the operations are not very precise and he has to do some uh, precise things in, in measuring distances in fixing with a screwdriver etc and the objective is to know what are of from these different tasks different operations sorry what are uh, best to be done by the humans and the others by the robot. Donc the first thing, first step uh, was the evaluation of the human. And then now we can evaluate the, the robot from this task decomposition on subtasks. And these subtasks are uh, associated to different simple tasks, which are 
pick and place. And now we are focused on pick and place operations because for these uh, first simple tasks, we have to do the modelization of the robot, do the same with the, with the human and try to obtain, for example, uh, wait for when in the workspace, where is the good workspace for the robot and its intersection with the human and try to obtain this kind of evaluation where the indexes we used can be uh, the conductor in order to, 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 uh, to give the uh, allocation tasks between the robot and the human. So I, at the end, the objective is to know, depending on the, uh, the operational, uh, operational uh, part of the, the work, which is the best allocation that we can give it to the robot or the, to, to the human. On the left here, we have uh, a good score for the collaboration. So for this kind of uh, allocation, we can do our collaboration and it will, it will be uh, the best. For the second one, we need maybe to add some equipment to the robot in order to improve this collaboration. As a conclusion, we can uh, see some objectives and some results obtained. So we obtained the model that can be used to uh, facilitate the task allocations. And in the same time, we have to improve some, uh, some items in order to take into account inside the, the factory, inside the, the company, uh, these parameters. So our work was done in laboratory with the motion capture system. And now our, our objective is to try to transform it with a wearable, uh, wearable system with specific sensors developed in order to have in real time what is the evolution of, for example, the fatigue of the worker inside the company. When you do your evaluation in the morning, you are not sure that the, the worker could continue using the, the system all over the day. So this is why it's necessary to have such kind of systems in order to improve this uh, task allocation. So in the end, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank all my colleagues that uh, helped me in order to have this work presented to you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Benali. Um, we are continuing with the program. At this stage, um, to address the Sachi Chair, um, who will also be joining us online, is Dr. Gazale from UPEC, and um, she will address the Chair on a subject titled Generic Semi-Supervised Adversarial Subject Translation for Senior-Based Activity recognition. Dr. Gazale, we welcome you to the platform. Thank you so much. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, I think uh, it's going to be okay. Yes, we can hear you. We can. See. Okay. Okay. Yes, very good. Sorry for the quality of the internet. Maybe I can be a little bit deviated uh, due to some <laughs> um, connection issues. Um, yes. Uh, Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm uh, Gazelle Kodamander from UPEC uh, in Paris, and I will present the, the work that uh, we've done uh, last year 
and generic semi supervised adversary are subject to trans translation for uh, sensor based activity recognition. Um, um, so, um, the performance of human activity recognition or HAR models, particularly in deep neural networks, is highly contingent uh, upon the availability of the huge uh, amount of uh, annotated training data. Although uh, data collection and manual labeling um, is uh, in this domain are too expensive due to human research dependence in both steps. Also, our uh, data set are uh, usually uh, imbalanced data set. Uh, hence, domain adaptation techniques um, um, have been um, um, proposed uh, to adapt the knowledge from the existing uh, source of data. Recently, adversarial uh, transfer learning methods uh, have shown very uh, promising um, results from uh, visual classification. Yet, uh, they remain limited for hard problems, uh, which are still uh, prone to, uh, to the unfavorable effects of uh, the imbalanced distribution of samples. However, uh, it is more... Uh, uh, interesting to evaluate the performance of uh, um, in HAR model against many human subjects uh, who uh, their behaviors uh, data have not been encoded in the training data set. So in this work, uh, we've uh, proposed a novel generic and semi-supervised uh, approach uh, that takes uh, the advantage of uh, the adversarial framework to um, tackle uh, the the information uh, shortcomings uh, by leveraging knowledge from annotated samples and exclusively from the source subjects and the unbalanced samples of the target subjects. Um, Let's see what, what what's the problem of uh, the har uh, har uh, domain. The objective of har problem is uh, to find actually predicting uh, current activity according a sequence of uh, sensors outputs. In other words, um, starting from sliding window um, on a data set uh, where um, these windows uh, consist of uh, time series data uh, uh, with labeling, uh, with labels. I mean, um, they try to predict um, actually the current activity according to these uh, la labeled data. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, the limitation of our specific data set. Uh, um, and the difficulty of the, the hard uh, domain to collect data and also imbalanced data sets uh, drop uh, drastically the classification performance on OSIN samples, actually. So uh, this is due uh, mainly, I would say, uh, to a difference in conditional distributions between target and source data sets. So transfer learning techniques um, are here to boost uh, somehow um, the classification performance on data from new human uh, subjects. And now I will present the, our uh, proposed model, but before that, just uh, a little bit uh, review of uh, Classical generative adversarial network um, or GAN. In GAN, um, uh, we have a uh, um, classic GAN. I mean, uh, we have two components generator and um, discriminator. In the uh, generator, we have uh, um, actually, generator generates um, 
um, synthetic data or fake data from some random noises and discriminator try to uh, try to find um, this fake data and adverses uh, the generator actually and and generator tries in a step uh, um, generate uh, the data the more similar as possible to uh, the target data or the label data actually the cost function always usually i would say is um, uh, cross entropy and uh, uh, the objective function tries to play a min max game uh, between discriminator and generator until the convergence actually but uh, some challenges uh, exist in uh, again uh, models uh, which are first uh, the problem of imbalanced data they are too sensitive to imbalanced data and also uh, the difficulty of the generator um, uh, to uh, when updating uh, the gradients so uh, they are so unstable and also mode collapse uh, which is very famous uh, famous problem and also we cannot really um, uh, use uh, the tra negative transfer the sub solutions we have proposed in this work first is a one to one subject translation and then a classifier component. And um, we have added into the main architecture. And then also we have proposed to um, palliate the problem of imbalanced data with uh, using micro, micro mini batch uh, learning. Here is uh, the uh, global architecture of the model with a generator and this generator, of course, the classic GAN, and uh, we have added a new component, a classifier. Um, so the object function becomes, um, as you can see here, uh, always a, a min-max, uh, but here uh, we have added a new term and two coefficients um, so uh, we have to um, update um, the gradient between uh, a generator and a classifier and also between the disc discriminator and the a generator so generator generates some uh, fake data um, using um, um, uh, a classifier uh, in a way that uh, it generates these data, the fake data, in a way that uh, they are uh, uh, very similar to the source data. And then uh, the, the, in the other step, the discriminator try to uh, discriminate between these um, source data and the real target data. Uh, we have added also two coefficients in order to um, determine the uh, impact of adversar adversarial and the classification respectively in uh, the, the first and second term. And uh, in uh, training um, fashion, uh, we have um, trained the data, uh, whole data in two phases the first uh, phase is um, actually this um, training um, uh, manner it was introduced in order to alleviate the problem on call start because uh, when starting again uh, we a generator has no idea about the data uh, so uh, with this type of uh, training in three phases uh, we could uh, more or less elevate this problem so uh, in the first step we uh, train a discriminator and uh, we keep uh, constant generating and uh, classifier 
component. And of course, uh, the objective function changes uh, in function of each type of training. In the second part, uh, we train only uh, a classifier and uh, we keep a uh, constant discriminating and generative component. And the third phase is uh, to, to training now a generator um, in a way that uh, uh, we keep a uh, constant uh, cl the classifier and the discriminator. So in this way, uh, the generator could um, uh, generate uh, the more um, better data, I would say, in terms of similarity to the real uh, source data. Uh, we have the two, uh, the first two one uh, are very sim uh, famous and a little bit similar. Opportunity data set at BAMAP2, uh, which uh, opportunities is a larger scale data set and uh, is also in balanced data set. Um, map 2 is a middle size data set, but it's not really in balance. And the third one is our data set uh, that we've collected in our uh, laboratory in Lisi. It is a small data set, but, but um, it has this uh, specific, I would say, problem, which is a very highly imbalanced data set. So we have three types of uh, data sets. Uh, uh, on which uh, we have applied our models. And um, here, this graph show uh, depicts um, uh, the performance of our model um, in different classes, uh, like uh, a warm up, because uh, the data set is um, about the human activity, of course. Um, so there are different activities uh, like lying and standing and sit to stand, etc. Uh, so performance of the model mm, somewhere is uh, better than the others, but uh, generally speaking, um, our model um, can outperform uh, the others. Um, the other, I would say, methods uh, in the state of the art. And also here uh, we have the result of. Uh, Uh, on only our data set, uh, I mean LACI data set. So globally we have a good result, good scores um, uh, on different classes and uh, um, uh, comparing to uh, the other methods like um, SAGAN or uh, STL or uh, GFK. Um, so um, the conclusion, um, of uh, the work is that uh, up to 23 percentage weighted uh, uh, F1 measures improvement we had uh, in comparison to the, uh, the other state of the art uh, methods. And uh, we have proven also the effectiveness of our uh, proposed model to address the imbalanced uh, uh, learning challenge. Um, we have also some uh, uh, future uh, objectives, uh, like um, we would like to apply the model for multiple uh, source of knowledge, and uh, also we would like to do negative transfer learning. Uh, it means the inference of the previous knowledge with the new learning, and also maybe combining uh, transferred models from uh, different, different uh, source domain. Thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Gazale. Um, I just want to remind the speakers to please keep to your time that has been allocated for your presentation so that we can get the program going. Um, so the next speakers that will address the Sachi Chair um, on the subject of solutions of assistive technologies, specially adapted for speech and visual um, impairments. That will be Mr. Kyle Williams, who is a blind and low vision um, specialist. 
as well as Ms. Uh, Hartley, um, who is a speech pathologist from MicroEdit. Over to you, Mr. Carls and Ms. Hartley. Thank you so much. They are joining us online as we are continuing with the seminar hybrid environment. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for providing myself and Rushla Hartley the opportunity. We are from Edit Microsystems, and we are privileged to be with you guys today to take you into the eSight, which is vision assistive device for persons with visual impairment, specifically low vision. Now the eSight, as you can see, I've got it on my head. Um, I'm currently or am a user of the eSight as I've got low vision myself. Now the eSight is a clinically validated all-in-one wearable device for persons with visual impairments. You can wear eSight throughout the day. You can enjoy independence and you also have the ability <clears throat> you also have the ability to enjoy a greater visual acuity typically eSight users has uncorrected visual acuity that ranges from 20/60 20 slash 800 in some cases you have visual uncorrected visual acuity from 20 slash 1400 with the eSight remarkably you find users have remarkably many people achieve 20 slash 20 vision with the eSight glasses some of the listed eye conditions that the eSight does work for would be cataracts diabetic retinopathy glaucoma macular degeneration ocular albinism optic atrophy retinopathy of prematurity retinitis pigmentosa retinal detachment and as well as star guards. The eSight integrates a cutting edge camera, which is situated in the front of the glasses and two OLED high resolution screens, which is situated near to the eyes, which is sometimes referred to as near screens. With the eSight, with the eSight, it, it stimulates synaptic activity and compensates for gaps in your field of view by maximizing the gaps with the information provided to the brain. The eSight's built-in camera, once again, which is situated in the front of this device, captures everything that the wearer is looking at, whether this may be tasks that is done outside, indoors, or with the tasks that may be done outdoors. That information is then displayed for the user on near screens behind the shield in the front of the device. The device has been designed for ease of simplicity as well as wearable comfort with its halo style band, which goes around the head. You have the ability to use the eSight with the onboard touch panel to increase magnification decrease magnification as well and increase or decrease your contrast mode and switching between different color contrasts. The eSight can also be used with its wireless rem wireless controller. The eSight has two removable battery packs which are situated at the back of the headset. With this, the user will have uninterrupted time while using the eSight should, should a battery run flat at any point in time. The eSight is the world's first electronic wearable magnifier. Thank you so much for listening to me. Rusha, over to you. There we go. 
Thank you so much, Carl, for that demonstration of the e-site. Um, just to do a quick uh, rundown of the company before I go get into my product. So Edit Microsystems is an assistive technology company. Um, we have been around since 1991, so essentially for the last 30 years, um, providing assistive technology solutions to um, all governmental institutions, be it hospitals or schools, um, as well as the private sector as well. Um, so we really have a range of assistive technology solutions to cater really for, um, for all abilities, be it blind and low vision, which is what Kyle sort of demonstrated today, um, hearing impaired, assistive listening devices, and then also other forms of physical disabilities as well. Um, so what I'm going to be chatting about today is an assistive technology solution for those who present with physical impairments, particularly those who cannot use their arms. Um, and then, um, yeah, just speaking about that particular device. And like I said before, really just two devices we are chatting about today, but we really present with a range of different types of assistive technology solutions. So the device that I am going to be speaking about briefly it's referred to as the glass house i'm just going to bring the name up to my screen okay so it's the glass house device and essentially what it is it's an assistive technology solution for that pretty much mixes glasses with a gyroscopic mouse and a it assists those individuals that cannot use their arms to be able to navigate any type of uh, a computer, TV, uh, mobile device, as well as a tablet um, via Bluetooth technology. OK, so this is what the device would typically look like. You would place it on your head right like this. And like I said before, can connect to any type of uh, the glass house can connect to any type of device using um, Bluetooth as well as an automatic calibration, which obviously allow, allows individuals to control their, their device using very small head movements like this. And then with, the, with this particular device, there is a range of different types of switch adapted solutions um, to cater for, for individuals' needs. The switch that I have in my hand right now, this is referred to as a bite switch. So this would essentially be used with individuals that is physically disabled, perhaps spinal cord injuries, and the only means of them being able to access their computer is via very small head movements, as well as a bite switch option. So they would control using the mouse and then access any type of folder by biting down on the switch. There is a range of different types of switch um, adapted solutions. So this the Glasshouse device has a bite switch. It has a puff switch, which is the blowing option. Um, it has a foot switch, uh, other types of mechanical switches as well. Um, again, catering to the needs of different individuals. Um, in my experience, I have recommended this type of device um, for adults who have had spinal cord injuries, um, who requires this device for long-term usage. I have also recommended this particular device for individuals who are perhaps in surgical ICU, they have a tracheostomy tube in and they require a device to, to essentially communicate. So that's the other element of this particular device as well. As you are able to connect to any type of tablet or laptop, you can then connect to communication software um, and use it that way as well. I've also recommended this particular device to learners at special needs schools who perhaps would present with various forms of cerebral palsy um, that is not able to use their limbs, um, but they do have good head control. They are also able to use this device as well. It is very lightweight. It's less than 50 grams. Um, it can be used with spectacles. You can wear your spectacles underneath. And it does have a sleep mode option as well. So um, can be charged, but can be used for quite a long length of time. So really just a fantastic solution in terms of being able to cater for the needs of individuals who are not able to use their limbs, whether it is long term or temporary. Um, so I, I think that's my bit. <laughs> it's a fantastic solution. Um, I want to, to thank you just for, for including us in, in the seminar. Um, and like I said, Edit Microsystems, just 
just really just touching the surface of, of the range of, of assistive technology solutions that we can provide to those individuals with disabilities. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Williams and Ms. Hartley. Um, the next uh, segment of the program, we are going to continue on the subject, augmented mobility um, from Tony University of Technology Startup. And um, I'm going to call upon Dr. Nick Hussain um, and uh, Ms. Modise from FSATI and Electrical Engineering TUT. Uh, let us welcome them to the front. Thank you. Good morning for those that I haven't greeted it uh, yet. Um, yeah, before I start, uh, just a little bit of background um, and what the presentation will be about. And I just want to quickly do a few uh, uh, thanks. Um, augmented mobility, I think, wouldn't have been uh, possible. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful uh, that we are able to have a startup uh, within our electrical department and then also, of course, FSLATI. Um, we had great support from uh, so far from um, the Department of Research, Innovation and Engagement. And then also the faculty and also the department itself, FSATI. And also further, I must say that it would not have been possible if it wasn't the collaboration that we had. Um, and even with our guest uh, professors from French universities as Prof. Amam and also Prof. Giuliani and also uh, Prof. Monaselli from UVSQ. Um, so I just want to say thank you for that. And the uh, presentation, how we will do the presentation, uh, sort of fellow is also uh, from the, in the electrical department. I'm more from uh, FSRT, but also part, also form part of uh, electrical uh, department. And um, she will first uh, give just a little bit of background on the technology itself. Um, where does it fit into the environment as a tool for rehabilitation? And then after that, I'll just uh, uh, wrap up on uh, the, the part on the startup uh, within the university. Thank you, Tulf. Thank you, Dr. Stein. Uh, thank you. I'm good. Uh, thank you for the time. As I've been introduced, I'm Solofelo Mudise from the Department of Electrical Engineering as well as FSATI. Um, so just a background on, can I get this to work? Okay, I'm just going to start a bit while we're fixing the remote. Um, so since yesterday, it's been shared that over 1 billion people in the world are suffering from some form of physical impairments. And with that being the case, limiting their uh, inclusion in activities of daily living. So it's always... Um, important in order to innovate devices just like the ones that we saw previous with a previous speaker that are able to to bridge that gap between inability as well as ability disability okay. so yes there's been various assistive devices that have been thank you that have been shared over the years. So if we had to come to the part of rehabilitation, uh, the aim of the device basically is to get a person from a state of being immobile, uh, having maybe low muscle retention to where they're able to um, walk by themselves or at least be able to walk without, without much um, restrained. So in the middle there we have uh, rehabilitation, a therapist that is assisting a person 
to again relearn how to walk. So that's where we form, that's where we fit in, in order to limit the time for a person to relearn to walk, as well as encourage uh, the movement of a person. So the name of the innovation or the product itself, it's XG Motion. Uh, XG, the X being Zainal, Zainal being that friendship or hosting. So this is where the device uh, forms, fro forms friendship or a host to the human in order to better assist them. So there are different uh, available devices that are already in the market when it comes to uh, rehabilitation for mobility impairments. Uh, you do have parallel bars. But again, with parallel bars, the person would need some form of cognitive ability in order to operate such a device, as well as they're mostly bonded to hospitals or rehabilitation centers. They again focus more on the linear emotion. And as I said, being bonded to a hospital, it means that it needs more space. Roof-mounted devices, it's the same case also. Uh, it needs large spaces and it's normally limited to rehabilitation devices as well as hospital bonded. Your passive grade trainers, on the other hand, uh, they might require more than one therapist. So with this case, uh, while um, some of the other therapists might be assisting more patients, uh, this one limits all therapies to be present while assisting the person. So again, with the gait trainer, it decreases the stability. It has a decreased um, stability due, it's due to its passive element. Uh, you have more expensive systems. So this includes your, an example being the locker mat. Um, I think it's also being used at Netcare. Yes. Uh, so it's a costly device. Um, of course, it focuses more on linear motion and it's restricted to, to a healthcare device, just as the other ones. So the need for therapy training might be for people with stroke um, to help them relearn how to, to walk again or strengthen their muscle uh, formation. Uh, people that have been involved in traumatic uh, accidents, as well as elderly people that might need some form of a gait trainer or rehabilitation device. So the aim is to cater for different forms of uh, degrees of mobility for a person that needs severe assistance to a person that might need just every day working assistance. With that being the case, that's why the measuring point uh, is important. Firstly, to get the profile of the person's movement. Again, to get the signals that will be used to control the device in order to navigate itself as it's assisting the person. So from this point, uh, I could say three points have come to be important. From the ground plane, in respect to the ground plane there, we have the swing and the stance of the leg, also covering the rolling of the foot, sorry, of the foot, yes. And from the surgical plane, if we had to focus on the flexion angle of the thigh, as well as from the, I think we're missing one of the planes here, but yes, for the external as well as the internal rotation of the, of the leg. I think, Dr. Stein, you may take it off. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Philo. Okay, so if we look uh, here, uh, there you can typically see now, um, I think you also saw from the other presentations that um, such a system where you start to actually um, have a human in the loop, it becomes quite a complex system. So. If you look at the system here, it looks simple. Um, it doesn't look that complex. Um, but again, you have the human in the loop itself. So then it becomes uh, a fairly um, important um, that uh, you closely have a control and that uh, interaction between 
you can almost see it as a mobile robot um, because it is an active system and then of course the user as well and in this case the user also have a further a thing um, and that he needs re uh, rehabilitation um, because due to a certain disability so i think it, it becomes um, quite more important so if you look at uh, just uh, a basic description here, um, you will get basically your local uh, LIS commands. Um, and that is then uh, sent uh, to the user, of course. And those uh, commands can be both. Uh, it can be uh, forced and visual or forced and or visual only. Um, so you will get information then from the system telling the user what he needs to do. But it also might then basically um, move the user forward, force him in an active way. And then from the user, um, we need to measure, of course, the gait. Uh, I think there was a previous presentation, uh, maybe a fourth presentation, where they also had to measure um, the or capture the gait uh, of the user. Uh, they, they used IMU technology, so currently we base our uh, innovation also on that principle of IMU technology. Um, it's not just only to command the, the, the active device or the rollator, but it's also then to capture this information so that the clinician can use that and that the, clinician, uh, and the user as well need that information. And it needs to go then, of course, to the robotic walker or the active um, device. From that, uh, you can get in a mask inspection that you can see what is the desired gate that's needed in this case. And then from there on the relator itself or the, the active device, um, you get your motion and your guidance and support, of course. And then the clinician can then also evaluate then the progression of um, the person that needs the rehabilitation. I just need to make sure which one is now there. Yeah. Okay, so this is just to show you um, it can be used in different environments as well. I think uh, this comes in where you can see the different levels of rehabilitation that might be needed. Um, if it's tri a trivial uh, rehabilitation or on the first level, I mean, it could maybe be even used then uh, in an outdoor environment. So it means it's, it's not that fixed. Um, a user will be able to use it in such an environment. Um, you, this is an actual fact, the inclined environment, so it is, it's not a flat surface. Um, it could be used maybe in inclined environments and so on, so that you even give the, the user exposure to such an environment. Um, oh, no, I'll go back, sorry. Uh, this is just the seated, so it has the possibility to also have a seated uh, action. Um, now, if we look at uh, augmented uh, mobility as a startup, um, I think it's a progression towards a in, in, for an entrepreneurial approach. Um, certain things that's important. I think this is for for any, uh, even in a corporate environment or in a university environment. These are the steps that needs to be followed. Um, you, we need to have novel research outputs, uh, scientific publications, uh, prototype developments, of course, um, staff student qualification improvement, especially in, in of course, in the university environment, uh, generated intellectual properties, um, final product developments, and then licensing as well. So there's the typical technology transfer life cycle that one will go through. Um, some of these uh, points uh, we already managed to do with uh, to up to the prototype development, um, startup of the company itself, uh, licensing of um, the robotic rollator or Xenial motion, let me write, uh, use the, the correct word, uh, and naming. Uh, then also, I think the part where we currently find it very difficult is on the product development. Um, for product development, one must always keep in mind that I think especially in a research environment, um, it is, it's, it's again maybe on a different level. Um, one has to look at what's the practicality that's needed um, uh, in a, um, a user's uh, space. And... Um, so yeah, that, that's sometimes difficult to realize and conceptualize. Then, uh, of course, I also heard this uh, from uh, Prof. Monacelli mentioned uh, that uh, they are adding um, uh, emotion uh, to the gyro lift. 
um, I think that's that's a very important thing. But what I want to say here is, uh, especially on machine learning, um, I mean, that will still go on the research and then incorporating that back again into your prototype or your development or maybe the final product that you have. Um, so it will always be like a cycle that will continue over and over. Um, just currently, uh, we got three phases. It's just the mechanical structures. We divide it into three phases, sensors, electronics, actuators, and fittings. Uh, so the prototype is there, final product still that we need to develop. So if we look at AIM as a startup, uh, dream big, set goals, take action, so maximize engineering research outcomes. I think eventually, if we have a company inside the university, these are things that one really would like to look at. Um, and also uh, that other... Um, startups maybe that's inside the university or inside the, the department can actually learn from us and we'll be able to guide them. So excel in entrepreneurial skills and technology transfer opportunities, accelerate the formation of sustainable engineering entrepreneurship. And also, I think a very important part is to augment uh, national exposure in order to transfer knowledge. Okay, so to become visible to the direct community. Um, and I think the most important part here is uh, if you look at the national uh, development plan, this is this is a really a very crucial point, um, and that is to cultivate innovative research, engineering solutions, and entrepreneurial skills. Um, and this this is eventually to alleviate um, poverty and also um, the high un unemployment rates that we currently are sitting with. Okay, so let me skip this maybe, uh, my time. Um, so I think eventually if you look at it, um, currently um, sitting on a scale where we have teaching, research, prototyping, um, then we also have on the other side, entrepreneurship, commercialization. I think it's, uh, we just need to find that balance eventually. Okay, that's it, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nika and uh, Tulu Fellow. Thank you very much. Um, next on the program, we are joined again um, by a speaker online um, on the subject of epidemiological modeling of the dynamics of COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, uh, we're gonna speak, uh, skip that speaker. I'm going to uh, jump um, on to um, the next speaker who is an associate professor Mjimo Mziachi from the VETS Graduate School of Business Administration. And he will address the Saatchi chair on the subject of 5G network and haptic enabled internet by remote robotic surgery. He is joining us online. Let us welcome um, uh, the Associate Professor Mziachi. Welcome to the platform. Over to you, Professor. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Program Director, and good day, everyone. I hope I'm visible and audible. Thank you very much. So my name is Njumo Mzieche. I'm at Witz University. So let me start by thanking the organizers, particularly Professor Karim Juani and Professor Anish Kurian for the invitation to present today. Uh, this is our theme, a 5G network and haptic enabled internet for remote robotic surgery. So this is joint work done with a postdoctoral fellow here at WITS, Maradona Gattara, and also Professor Sijo Parakatil, uh, who is an electrical engineer and a robotic surgeon. He's based in the United States. Um, he's a practitioner, he runs Avant Concierge Urology, so he's a robotic microsurgery urologist, and he's also an associate professor of urology at UCF in Florida. So let me proceed. Uh, for the next few minutes, I just want to share with you briefly on this theme. This is the outline, so I'm going to summarize the key points that are like to convey, uh, say something about the context of the research, then I'll go into a few details on the topic uh, at hand, 5G and haptic internet for remote robotic surgery. We'll then look at TTF and TTF modeling, that's task technology fit. 
the methodology that we use in the research, summarize our contributions, and then tell you a little bit about ongoing and future work, and conclude. So these are the main messages I'd like to convey just in this one slide. First is the need for us to explore the fit between technologies on the one hand and end user tasks on the other hand, in order to create better services. So it's not enough to just look at one or the other, but we need to look at both. And for that purpose, we are proposing a task technology fit modeling research as a promising way forward. This is also linked with a shift uh, in terms of how we design and optimize our networks from a quality of service point of view or perspective to a quality of experience and quality of task perspective. We believe this is potentially extensible to other human in the loop scenarios and the colleagues, the other speakers that have been presenting today have outline some of those other possible scenarios, and that it is also broadly applicable to 5G and beyond 5G networks. So those are the main messages. In terms of the seminar itself, these are the three main themes. And so we are on the second theme here, robotics and how it relates to modeling and control with human in the loop scenarios. So just a little bit of more background. This work is related to this research that has been ongoing for some two, over two years now. And uh, we've presented some of this work at the Wireless World Research Forum meeting, uh, where we are members of the vertical industry platform working group on 5G, e-health, m-health, and wearables. And we presented a paper early in the year on this topic, and some of the highlights I'm presenting will be from that paper. I'm happy to share this with, with anyone that might be interested. This diagram on the left-hand side here shows the areas of interest for this working group. Now, this is familiar to you from some of the other talks, so the generic 5G use cases. What we'll be discussing remote robotic surgery is closer to the ultra-reliable and low latency communications vertex of the triangle. So coming to remote robotic surgery itself, here we're showing two scenarios. So on top, you have a, a local, robotic surgery scenario. You can see the surgeon sitting at the uh, surgeon console there. There's the patient side cart on, on this end. The patient would be, of course, on the operating table. And then there's a the vision card, which has all the electronics and systems um, that interconnects everything, particularly with the, the high resolution vision. On the bottom is a, a diagram showing a remote robotic surgery scenario. This is from a technical report from C3GPP on critical medical applications. And so again, you can see we have the patient console here, the robot here, but in this instance, they are separated by this 5G uh, links. Now, in this scenario, these would likely be private 5G links, or if they're on public 5G networks, they would have dedicated slices. Um, and then you've got a medical application system or subsystem here in between the two ends of the system. The trocars would hold the surgical instruments, the endoscope um, has all the visioning system, and the patient would be at the same. So the, the CMED uh, report or technical report from 3GPP outlines these four scenarios or modalities, as it calls them. Two of them uh, relate to remote scenarios. So I've highlighted the one which we're most interested in here, which is 
a static remote scenario and use cases. The one we're looking at specifically is remote robotic surgery, but there's also uh, an emergency care use case. For instance, you'd be able to do remote ultrasound examinations or provide remote interventional support. Then there's mobile specialist practice. So, uh, for instance, a, a mobile ambulance here that moves around from place to place would be, would be an example of this. Moving remote scenario number four would be a typical example here would be a moving ambulance. So the ambulance is moving and uh, you're having to provide critical medical care in that instance. Then you have uh, these localized scenarios. There's a static one, which is similar to the classical room, uh, robotic surgery scenario, but you also have this moving um, modality whereby patients, equipment, uh, medical staff may be moving around. Okay, but we're focusing on what I've highlighted in both the static remote and remote robotic surgery. So this is just to give you a flavor of the complexity of what's involved here from a technology standards point of view. You can see, and this is not exhaustive by any means, this is just to illustrate uh, this sort of engineering that's required to make such a system work. So 3GPP would have these four standards, uh, and this is just, as I say, a sample. Then you'd have to look at the digital imaging and communications. From the IEEE side, you'd have to look at timing and synchronization, so the PTP protocol, precision time protocol. Then there would be application of risk management um, in IT networks, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so forth. Cybersecurity, we haven't even mentioned. So there's very many technology standards that would need to be incorporated to make the system work. Okay, so as we said, we are interested in this human in the loop interaction. So the picture on the left is of uh, my collaborator, Professor Paracatil, his operating room there. Um, but the key points here are that these human in the loop aspects would be essential when we're looking at uh, remote robotic surgery. So typically we're not going to be um, looking at autonomous surgical systems. I think those are very far off right now. Uh, this is something that is more foreseeable and feasible and something that we're actually working towards. Quality of experience would be essential for the surgical tasks, for measuring the, the surgical tasks um, as they are perceived by the surgeon. And then quality of task would be a measure of the precision with which the surgeon can perform the, 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 the functions that they need to perform, or the tasks that they need to perform. This is the system architecture, similar to what has been shown by some of the earlier speakers. So we have three main domains. The master control domain on the left here, surgeon would be here. The intervening, interconnecting network domain. So this would be our 5G network. And then the remote domain would be where the patient is. Now, very briefly on task technology fit theory. So this is a, a framework uh, theory that is very well established in the information systems field. And it allows us to measure the degree to which the functional capacity of uh, some technology tool system meets user needs or activity demands for a particular set of tasks. And then alongside that, we can consider utilization and performance impacts, specifically as they relate to use and then user tasks. Okay, so, so TTF is then about establishing the, the link between these two, two areas, the technology aspects on the, on the one hand, and then the use and user perform task performance aspects on the other hand. Uh, this chart is just showing the TTF visually. So you've got tech task characteristics up here, technology characteristics up here, and TTF allows us to link these two. There's the interesting 
um, aspect of underfit. So your technology is an underfit for the task characteristics, or you may have overfit as well. So you want to be right smack bang in the middle here where uh, this is, is well balanced. And then on the user side, we are looking at utilization, performance outcomes, and user reactions. So this is a model that we are proposing for remote robotic surgery. Um, I'm not going to go through all the details, but just at a very high level, we see task characteristics, technology characteristics, and then the fit model here uh, between the two. On the user side, so in other words, the surgeon side, we look at user task performance, and then the HSI, uh, technology and remote controlled uh, robot use aspects as well. So the research approach is, is as shown. We want to, be, to find relationships between the constructs in the model, um, and then examine the TTF model and its use and user performance effects as related to technology use and task performance. To do this, we use pre-validated questionnaires and surveys that we carry out with robotic microsurgeons. So this work is currently underway. And then the final thing would be to test uh, potential nonlinear effect of the, the TTF model on use and user performance. So this just illustrates uh, more practically what we're talking about. So here's the surgeon on the left and some of the tasks that they may have to do, a surgical task that is, so grasping palpation and incision, for instance. On the technological side, you've got the surgeon manipulating the robot remotely, and you have the manipulators, uh, haptic devices, and then the robotic uh, manipulators on the remote end. So these are some excerpts from the, the paper, and as I said, I'm happy to share this, so I'm not going to go through them in detail, but what I want to point out Characteristics. So here we're trying to measure the task construct characteristics. Um, so this is what the, the surgeon is, is trying to do. And you can see that this is mirrored by the technology construct characteristics. So the surgeon wants to, if we take TCA1A as an example, wants to control the movement of the surgical robot. And then on the remote end, um, the, the surgical, the technology should actually affect that control of the, 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 surgical, the surgical robot. And then on the use side, again, we see this mirror. We have use in terms of frequency, intensity, and dependence. This is mirrored with user performance in terms of effectiveness, efficiency, and quality. So again, the mirror image on the on the use use side. Okay, so let me let me summarize the contribution and give you an indication of what we're doing currently. So this work proposes and develops a conceptual TTF model in the practical context of remote robotic surgery, and it allows us to take a quality of experience, quality of task centered perspective to 5G networks and haptic-enabled internet, whereby real-time immersive remote robotic surgery tasks can be carried out. The work can inform, in terms of its practical implications, can inform design guidelines on, on how we uh, put together such remote uh, task performance use cases or services uh, in future. In terms of ongoing work, we are working with robotic surgeons. So Professor Car Paracatil is uh, crucial to that. So it's, it's one thing for us to speculate about how this works in the real world. 
But through our collaborator, we have links to robotic microsurgeons and we are testing and validating the model. And we hope to eventually, in due time, be able to understand very precisely what are some of the real-time surgical task performance issues that are involved from a quality of experience and quality of task-centered perspective. So key takeaways then, I'm almost closing now. The traditional quality of service, service requirements approach to designing networks is limited. What we want to do is evolve towards human to machine uh, or human to robot interactions. And in so doing, realize haptic enabled quality of experience and quality of task, internet of skills. We think this is potentially extensible and applicable to other use cases, some of which other speakers have mentioned. And what this work also highlights is the importance of multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary research and development. So this work, for instance, has aspects of communication systems, information systems, and medical science and practice. So we believe this, this kind of approach is really important. So finally, this is a quote from a, uh, an article that was published in Nature that was looking at the Da Vinci robot, which is the most widely used uh, robotic surgical system. And robotic surgeons were quoted as saying, the success of robotic surgery lies solely in the skill of a surgeon, is what one of them said. Another one said, it's always the surgeon's hands, not the technology that we use. So in conclusion, what we want to say is that all of this is about the end users. So the patients and the patient outcomes, and of course the surgeon, not about the, the technology per se. We believe this research uh, puts those uh, two categories of individuals at the center. So thank you very much uh, for the time and opportunity to, to present to you. I'm happy to share the paper and discuss, uh, explore collaborations with any colleagues or other listeners, viewers who might be interested. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Professor Mziashi. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take a lunch break right now. Um, on my time, it's 12.42, so we are going to return at 13.10, at 10 past 1, 10 minutes after 1 p.m. So do enjoy your lunch break, and I will see you then um, seated at 10 minutes past 1. Thank you so much.
Welcome back, everybody. Um, we are continuing with the program. Um, in this segment of the program, as we are continuing with the seminar on hybrid environment, um, I'd like us to welcome Dr. Waji Zahran, a CEO at Midis from France, um, on the subject that he will address. The Sachi Chair is titled Happy Care Integrating IoT, Blockchain, and AI for enhancing telecare. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let us please welcome Dr. Waji Zahran, who is joining us online. Thank you so much. Over to you, Doctor. Okay. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in your uh, meeting and your presentations. Um, I'm uh, the president of the company called Medis. And uh, Medis is a company that exists on the market in healthcare market since more than 26 years. And we uh, spend about 40% of our revenue in research and development. And in France, we are one of the leaders on that market because we are working in a partnership with about 500 public hospitals to create the new generation of software to be used in healthcare especially in the hospitals and all the medical centers around the hospitals and also the physicians, uh, specialists or dentists uh, working or tour hospital uh, between, you know, in, uh, around the hospitals. So uh, we are working on innovation programs and uh, our innovation programs, of course, uh, concerns healthcare. And as you know, healthcare after the COVID-19 is taking a lot of importance. And uh, we have some uh, ideas uh, that we put on the market uh, for COVID. But uh, today I will uh, try to uh, explain what we are doing today and what is the future for healthcare. Because healthcare today is seeing a lot of changements and the new technology is coming and we think that uh, in the coming years uh, the that way to uh, detect uh, diseases or uh, follow up patients will change completely and this uh, thanks to uh, to the artificial intelligence and to all the technology new technology like iot that is coming uh, to the market and now is used for healthcare. Uh, we have seen a lot of generations of software and technology in healthcare during the past uh, 20 or 30 years. We started uh, healthcare uh, uh, technology or uh, uh, information system by transforming papers to uh, uh, to uh, computers so we call that numerical transformation but we were duplicating exactly what we can see on the papers or what the files or forms to be uh, filled to screens on the computer then uh, a new generation came how to use this information to add some uh, intelligence in the system so we were doing some uh, business analysis uh, like uh, uh, statistics about uh, the diseases, the number of patients that visits the, the hospital or the physicians. And uh, then it came, it came a few years after, uh, or a few years after, a new uh, aspects of how we can add intelligence in the software so we can help the doctors or physician to decide and diagnostic uh, in a more efficient and quicker way. But this is... Uh, uh, hold on, please. Let me see how can I do that. Uh, hold on, please. Uh, okay, because I, I am trying to push to the bottom and see the camera, but I don't know why it's not working. 
Okay. Sorry about that. So, um, so where are we? Uh, so what we uh, try to do is how we can do prediction of disease. You know, everyone knows uh, in this meeting that uh, uh, prediction will let us to delay uh, the, the disease, the arrival of the disease, and also will reduce the cost of treatment. Uh, so what, what we have done is we try to develop what we call a patient portal. And this patient portal, uh, are you seeing my, my slides? OK. No, the slides are not uh, moving. Okay, that's that's why I'm I'm trying to see. Okay. Okay. So we we have built what we call a patient portal, and this patient portal uh, is uh, uh, handling all the connections or all the communication between a patient and any. Uh, hospital or uh, any uh, physician or any healthcare facility. So, uh, so all the connection or communication between uh, doctors working in hospitals or medical centers and the patient are going through the portal. We started a first uh, step is to add what the people are asking for like appointments online appointments and then we started to add more intelligence to this portal and uh, we started to add uh, the collection of information about the patient and uh, through iot and uh, all the, the information were going to the physician but not integrated in the hospital database unless a physician is uh, uh, seeing this uh, and validating this information. So uh, we started to use now a, uh, engines, intelligent engines, to uh, analyze this information coming through the IOTs. And we started to build applications around this uh, concept, like telediagnostic, uh, like telemedicine, and also about monitoring the patient outside the hospital at home and also uh, coaching this uh, patient. So uh, we can see that uh, the IoT system uh, uh, can uh, collect the information, but we need intelligent uh, engines that will analyze analyze this information in order to do this analysis and have medical we need to have medical know-how of course integrated in the system but to do to reach that we needed to analyze information history of the patient so we worked on a database with about 20,000 patients through 20 years of history and uh, we were lucky because this information uh, were structured information. So this is information were not a text, it was structured data. So we could have the analysis and we extracted by the, analyze, uh, uh, the uh, analysis of this information over 20 years of 20,000 patients, a lot of rules that uh, for pathologies. We started with one pathology, which is diabetics and we uh, build a, a smart system to predict for diabetics and also to follow up the the patient afterwards and advise the patient of the way of living so we, we call that coaching and this coaching uh, helped a lot of patients to uh, delay the, uh, the the arrival of the disease or getting worse uh, uh, in the disease situation. So uh, this system 
is build uh, about all this knowledge that we got from the history of the patients or 20,000 patients through 20 years. So we added after that uh, communication or real-time communication between the patient and doctors, the possibility of physicians to uh, send information or prescriptions to the patient, the possibility of patient to assess themselves through forms and send information to doctors. And also we have automated this system so alerts can be sent to physician about the situation of the patient in real time and doctors could follow up or send information or advices to patient in real time. Uh, we we used a, a, a system, uh, of course, uh, to uh, secure uh, the information transfer, uh, the transfer of information from uh, IOTs or from the patient side to the physicians or vice versa. So we used a blockchain uh, information systems to secure the transfer of information, and uh, this gave us. Uh, a lot of security uh, and uh, secured that the data that we receive through IOTs are the right data and secure data. I, I, I don't know if you can see now my use cases. Okay, hold on, please. You can see me now? Okay, thank you very much. So uh, this is, uh, I don't know, I've got a lot of sites to present more things, but um, if, uh, you, I think we have only 15 minutes, so I don't know if, uh, we want uh, to go further or it's um, we uh, stay there and uh, i gave some ideas about what we are doing but we have got also some new ideas coming on about innovation in healthcare and uh, of course uh, there are a lot of projects concerning diseases because we are going to study disease per disease or pathology chronic uh, diseases and try to build the same intelligence disease per disease. We started with uh, diabetics, but we are working on other diseases, Cardio cardiovascular diseases, we are working about uh, neurology uh, and uh, diseases. We are working on disease per disease to add more and more intelligence to uh, follow up uh, and monitor patients uh, during their day life and also to alert doctors if anything happens. But also we give the uh, possibility to doctors to communicate with patients and advise the patient about the way of their living or how to improve uh, the control of the disease. Thank you very much. And I hope that uh, I have uh, presented you my ideas clearly. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, at this stage, I'm going to call um, Dr. Kauter, who is also joining us online, and uh, she will address the chair on the subject of trusted artificial intelligence. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Dr. Kauter. She is, from, she is the head of data science from Atos in France. Over to you, Dr. Kauter. Welcome to the platform.
Okay. All right, we are continuing with the program as um, we prepare um, for the next speaker. Um, the subject that will be addressed to the Sachi Chair um, is titled IoT, a key enabler of the circular economy. And um, the speaker is Dr. Noel, um, Head of Innovation from Heliot Group in France. Ladies and gentlemen, let us please welcome Dr. Noel as he's going to um, address this uh, Sachi Chair on the subject, IoT, a key enabler of the circular economy. Over to you. Thank you so much. Can we look at this? Good afternoon, everyone. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here to see some familiar faces. Um, so I've, be, I've been involved with uh, TUT and uh, FSATI since uh, 2003. I think it was Technicon Pretoria and FSATI, there was no E. Uh, there was an E at the end. Um, and I remember when we first started, we discussed about 2G. So 2G mobile network, uh, and then we went to 3G, which was so-so, uh, coming 4Gs, and now it's 5G. Uh, why I'm talking about this? Because now I'm part of something which is called 0G. So as you can see here, uh, it's not 10G. So it's a new standard that is being promoted for IoT, massive IoT. So it's quite funny to... Um, to put this into perspective. So I'm in charge of um, innovation and strategy, um, basically looking at the solution of tomorrow and day after tomorrow. Um, so it's really, really, um, I would say, uh, exciting. So IoT, as you know, it's been a very, there was a lot of hype. Okay, IoT is going to change everything. And then there were a lot of disillusion. And, um, and I think right now, these technologies, which are basically low-tech, uh, very simple technologies, they will change a lot of things. Ah, thank you. So I've prepared only a couple of slides, uh, not too much. Since we are in the academic world, uh, let's start by some definitions. <laughs> um, but because it's also somehow a, a bit difficult to understand uh, the, the Sigfox ecosystem. So Sigfox is basically the name of the technology and the name of a company. So for the one uh, here, which are not familiar with this technology, it's very much similar to LoRa. You might know LoRa standards or to NB-IoT. And the way it works is Sigfox is running the core network Okay, for this, uh, for carrying the messages. And to have the network in various countries, they are looking at partners. So in uh, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and Slovenia, it's Elliot Group. I'm working for Elliot Group. But in South Africa, you have Squidnet. Squidnet is a DFA company, and they are running the Sigfox network in South Africa. So if you were interested to experience um, IoT with Sigfox in South Africa, this is already available. In terms of uh, model, it's like a mobile um, virtual network operator. So yes, Sigfox is running the core network, and then you have the operator running the radio access network. So mobile virtual network operator is like CellC and FNB Connect or ShopRite connect okay so at Elliot we are FNB connect for the for the connectivity um, very good zero G so zero G yes it's uh, opposite to 5g so it's very simple very small bits of information uh, so it's very efficient in terms of power and it's very low throughput so from the network point of view one 5g base station, is consuming as much energy as 1,000 Sigfox gateway. Okay, so there is a ratio from one to 1,000. In terms of devices, the devices can run 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Of course, there is no magic. <laughs> they can run that long because the amount of uh, data that is being basically uh, sent over the network is very small. So we, the maximum is 12 bytes in uplink eight bytes in downlink, and we can send it only one every 10 minutes. So now you understand why it can last that long. You're going to say, okay, what can we do with this small amount of information? Actually, we can do a lot. 
Okay, so if you put in place edge computing, AI, and so on and so forth, you don't need a big pipe to send meaningful, meaningful information. Um, what is funny enough is that right now, our biggest customer is the Deutsche Post, DPDHL, that is using us on our network to track assets. And they do send only three messages per day in average. Okay, so nobody on the network is sending every 10 minutes because it's not efficient. Okay, from a battery point of view, so it's very low, low tech, uh, and this is one of the good, the good aspects of it. Um, the last thing is IoT. IoT is just a new, uh, a new name for machine to machine. Okay, it's been there for a very long time, <laughs> so it's it's still uh, it's, it's still the same thing that we branded as Internet of Something. Uh, it went through this hype, okay, which helped us actually to raise a lot of money. Then it crashed. And now we are seeing some maturity in the technology ecosystem and it's going to have, going to have a big impact on, on everything. So here you can see some of the other figures. Uh, you see we're talking about trillion. This is not happening. Now everybody's losing money <laughs> in IoT and losing big money, to be honest. But it's going, so because it's, it's going to feed your AI and big data system with piece of information that is going to be very, with a very low TCO, total cost of ownership, okay? Uh, that is going to change a lot of things. But right now, everybody has been investing in it and everybody is losing money. Um, hopefully in the next five years, we can do something. Uh, so you have all this, it's, it's a bit theoretical, but you have all these areas here. Um, there are two distinctions I wanted to make. Uh, consumer IoT versus industrial IoT and critical IoT versus massive IoT. And actually, we are talking about IoT for everything, but you can always classify into this, these different categories. So consumer IoT versus industrial IoT. Consumer IoT is your smartwatch. Okay, smartwatch here, it's connected to Bluetooth, to your phone, it's measuring your heart rate, if you are moving enough, and if you are not moving enough, it's ringing and telling you to move more. <laughs> <laughs> so this is consumer consumer IoT, uh, and the main standard is going to be BLE, uh, Bluetooth Low Energy. Industrial IoT is all the hidden uh, IoT that has been there for a very long time, uh, working at industrial level and with utilities. Uh, and in this sector, RFID, code bar, RFID, and some type of long range protocol is going to, to, to be used. And this is where Sigfox is actually sitting. Um, critical IoT versus massive IoT. Critical IoT was shown by um, earlier this morning with this, um, I mean, uh, surgery, online surgery, and so on and so forth. So all the application in which you need real-time low throughput are going to be handled by 5G and maybe later by, by 6G, okay? Autonomous vehicles, this type of thing. And this is critical IoT. This is smallish volumes, okay? It will be the small volumes. The massive IoT with very large volumes is the one that you don't really see. Is the one um, in which you are going to have your gas metering that is going to be smart, your electrical, electrical meter that is going to be smart, water meter as well. Uh, you are going to put one tag or one sensor on every, every asset, basically. Okay, uh, it can be chairs, it can be boxes, and so on and so forth, um, where you need minimalistic type of, of, of information. And this is also what we're trying to address. So I'm basically working in a field which is industrial and massive, so to speak, not sexy at all. <laughs> what we do, we are tracking roller cages. We are tracking shopping carts. We are tracking plastic boxes. And you might say, okay, why do you do this? It's because these things are getting rust between 8 and 12% per year. And it's such a big waste. It's a big waste for everybody. The people producing these boxes and using them, I mean, everybody is okay with it. Okay, It's like throwing 40% 40, 40 of the food uh, is okay in what we do now. Uh, but if you were to monitor and track these assets, you will be able to actually use them more efficiently and stop wasting uh, resources. So very simple here, IoT is, okay, you have some sensors and here you can see a, um, basically a cow, you can see a fire alarm, you can see home. So very small piece of information. You want to know if a bin is full or not, okay? 
because you just want to go and empty the bin when it's full. You don't want to send somebody that is going to use fuel and petrol to go there if it's not empty. Okay, so you're just going to send one simple measure: is full or not? Um, for animal stock, you want to know if the body temperature of the animal is okay or not okay. Because if it's not okay, then it's going to be sick. Okay, and you want to be able to address it. If there is fire, you want to know what is the water consumption, you want to know, and all this type of thing. And then it's going through a dedicated uh, network, the base station, going to a cloud, and then being pushed to, a, to an IT system. The way we do now is we are totally abstracting the technology from what we, what we sell. And when you come to us, you will be able to buy, for example, temperature. Let's say you want a temperature reading five times a day in a room, okay? And we are going to give you a price. You want to know a location of a car, we are going to give you the price as well, and so on and so forth. You are going to say it's not rocket science. No, it's not. But what is different is the price. Our, we sell our data from 0 0.7 euro to 1.5 euro per month per asset. Okay, so for, uh, how much is it? For five rand? Yeah, or for less. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 15 rand, sorry, 15 rand. <laughs> you can have a measure of temperature or location directly in your system. Why? It's because this low tech, this is very simple stuff, very low energy, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is what is changing. It's affordable so that it can be widespread used. Okay, so this is just a few figures about Sigfox to give you a scale. Uh, no, no worries, we are here in uh, we are in 72 countries. Uh, it's about 18 million devices registered now, uh, so it's it's growing. I've chosen four use cases related to um, to assistive technologies. Uh, Knowing that it's not our core business, we are more in circular economy, but anyway, this is uh, actually uh, commercialized by Vox in, in, in South Africa. This is a very simple way to monitor um, senior people, okay, all people living in the, in the house. What is it? It's very simple. It's motion detector, it's door sensor, and then you have a button, an emergency button. And this system is actually measuring the pattern of a person moving between the kitchen to the bedroom to the toilet and so on and so forth and collecting data over a few days and so on and so forth and then in a stationary mode is going to detect abnormalities so if somebody is not in the kitchen by 8 15 while she's usually in the kitchen by 8 15 okay then an alert will be sent you don't need video feed, you don't need all this type of thing, and especially video feed, it's not compliant with GP, GDPR, data and confidentiality. Just by very simple measure, movement, you are able to assist, to assist uh, people. This one is even more simpler, okay? You just need to put a button, you can see this is a white thing there, a button on the fridge door, okay? So this button has an accelerometer, so it's going to detect when the fridge is open or not. And you can push it in case of emergency. Okay, so very, once again, very low tech. <laughs> you detect if the person is actually opening, so it's not in bed, okay, and not sick in bed. Um, this one here is a tracker. So I put, I put a, a cat and a dog just to show you the size, okay, of the tracker, it's very small. So this one are GPS tracker. But once again, uh, on one battery, they can last three years, okay? So it's, imagine your mobile phone, okay? A mobile phone that lasts for one day and a mobile phone that lasts for three years, it's not the same device, okay? It's not gonna give you the same type of, of information. So these things now, they last for three years. They are very small, very affordable, and you can put them on cat, dogs, but especially on kids uh, and, and old, older people. And this one here is about defibrillator, monitoring of the defibrillator. Okay, we are almost, okay, finger crossed. Huh? <laughs> we won't use them, but you can put very simple device that is telling you if the door is open, it's in a box. If the door is open, if the door is closed, there is auto test on the defibrillator every day. So it's just going to report the auto test, okay, instead of only showing it on a, in, a, in a LED. 
Okay, so once again, it's it's quite uh, quite low tech. To conclude, um, there's a lot, lot of research ongoing in this field, um, and it's cross-functional. Uh, so basically, we do see a lot of research potential in energy harvesting. Okay, uh, so because basically we want to be able not to replace batteries. Okay, so energy harvesting it can come from the RF source, it can come from vibration, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of uh, research ongoing. Uh, printed electronics and printing batteries. Uh, we are going to put electronics and batteries on almost everything. Okay, we want to be able to <laughs> to recycle them, uh, also that they are even better. They can be um, biodegradable. So printed electronics is actually coming into um, to a maturity stage. We're working a lot on this. And printing battery, if you can find a printed battery that can work at zero degrees, you are a rich man <laughs> or a rich woman. Okay. Um, in mold electronics. So if you think that you want to put a tracker or a small device into a, a shopping cart, okay, you will be able to inject, you need to be able to inject electronics within the plastic at manufacturing level. Because basically the cost to attach a device after the production is almost two years of the of the total cost. Okay, so in mold electronics, edge computing because we have a very small pipe, so you need to calculate a lot of things um, in the device. And the last point is security. Nobody cares about security in IoT, huh, to be honest. It's a general concern in the public, but in the industry, nobody cares because it's additional hardware, it's complication. So we still need to find simple things, um, and. This is the key message is all these technologies, they are going to be very simple, like a simple mathematical formula, like a simple <laughs> line of code. Uh, it needs to be simple and cheap so that it will be um, widely uh, adopted. If you want to know more, Monday and Tuesday, there is a lecture. Okay, I'm facilitating a class on IoT. Uh, so if you want to attend, I think it's, Anish, that is handling the, the registration. Thank you very much. And last thing I forgot, this is one of the things we do. Okay, just to show you, this is a smart label. Okay, it costs 60 rand. You can basically, it's monitoring temperature. You can decide which temperature to monitor. And you put it on parcel. And when you open it, it's sending a message to say that the parcel has been opened. So this is a type of electronic we are looking at. So this is also IoT. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Noel. Um, I'd like to welcome once again, Dr. Kauta, who is going to address the chair on the subject of um, trusted artificial intelligence. Um, Dr. Kauta is the head of data science at Atos in France. Um, let us welcome Dr. Cote. Dr. Cote, over to you. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. So do, do you hear me? Okay, good. So I will share my screen. Do you see my screen as well? Okay. So yeah, thank you for this invitation and I'm very happy to be uh, with you virtually. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you for also for this uh, presentation. Uh, no, if, because I I'm trying to, to go to the next slide. <laughs> So yeah, um, as you present, yes, I'm Kauter Skiwer, so uh, Head of Data Science uh, within uh, Atos Group and also AI Authoritative Advisor. Uh, I had a background on AI as PhD and also as a researcher in some um, laboratory in France uh, and with this, uh, several collaboration. And today uh, the subject is about um, trusted AI. Uh, I will present you the challenges that we are facing as industrial, but also different collaboration that we had and the use case that we are working on, and the, the scientific uh, lock that we that we are facing today with uh, with AI. So uh, AI at the challenge and the, the the stage where we are today. So 
in terms of uh, industry and business, we are facing uh, globally five major challenges. The first one is about the internal skill in terms of AI. So what we what we are saying about this, it's more the people who will really create algorithms and not only to use the API that we have waiting Google, Amazon, Microsoft, or Python, or so on. The idea is to have the skills to create algorithm to do the training and um, and to be able to innovate in terms of creation of algorithms. So we are really facing a huge uh, a miss of skills in, in this area. The second challenge is about uh, data. So uh, it's not the volume because we can have a huge terabyte of, of data but at the end we don't have a lot of diversity quality and it's another challenge is to have the good data in terms of quality and also diversity the other one it's about uh, bias that we can uh, have in, in, in the data and also the bias that we can increase in the algorithm and it's another um, challenge if we are uh, uh, building an AI uh, critical systems uh, that will have a huge link with human. Uh, the other one, it's about the transparency of the AI model. We have the GDPR, but we, are, we have uh, other rules. The white paper of the Commission uh, of Europe, so, uh, so it lists several uh, rules that we will be um, uh, in, in, 20, in the next year, so uh, 2022, and we need to be able to, to do some production of AI projects and AI products that respect uh, the new rules, like the explainability of AI and to build uh, what we call trusted AI or responsible AI. The other challenge, it's more about the scalability um, of, of the model. So uh, in as industrial, so we start a lot of time, but we what we call the POC, the proof of concept. So then we train our model in a small data. And when we want to go to production so and to deploy, so we use all the data that we have. And here we have a problem of scalability, not only in terms of infrastructure but also in terms of the philosophy and the work of the algorithm because if you have if we create in terms of poc algorithm that's not distributed uh, uh, algorithm so at the end we will not achieve the good scalability and that are uh, typically the five uh, challenges that uh, that we are facing today and the objectives at the end is to achieve uh, a trusted ai based on four pillars the first, the, first, the first one is about fair and ethical. So that means that we, beat, we, we, we need to respect the fundamental right, human oversight, privacy, and fairness. The other one, uh, it's about robustness and safety. That means that uh, the accuracy in the model, it's not only to, uh, to, uh, to train the model in a data set and to verify that we have a good accuracy. For example, we have 80%. And when we go to, to deploy, uh, one year later, we will lose, lose the accuracy that we had when we developed the POC. So really, uh, something it's to, to have a robust model who will uh, be uh, adaptive models and who will keep the same accuracy um, uh, each time and for a, a long term uh, investment. The other one, it's about the security of AI. Uh, so that means that we will not only create uh, AI uh, with transparency, but we, we, we need to protect our systems, control hacking. Uh, for example, we see in, um, in some in, in Facebook or Twitter or others. So uh, people trying, you know, to. Um, to show that uh, there is some um, some opinion and it's not the right opinion because they they, they are able to to hack the model that Facebook are, are creating. So uh, and the idea it's when we are uh, creating something that uh, near to human use, for example, vehicle um, or um, or aircraft or something like this. The idea, it's really uh, when it's ba based on AI to keep uh, the protection of our AI system. So, and the other one, it's about safety, reliability, and so on. And uh, the other pillar, it's about uh, the industrialization. So it's not only to create AI model, 
and uh, in terms of science and research and not to be able to go to industrialization and to deploy it and to use it in real time with the end user. So that means that we need to keep traceability, maintainability, explainability of AI, tangibility and also scalability, of course. The other pillar, which is very, very important for, uh, for us and uh, as industrial, for uh, academic uh, people and also for us as human, it's about eco-sustainability. We, we, we know that AI can help to uh, reduce the carbon footprint, but also AI can really generate a huge carbon footprint. And the idea when we are creating an AI model to be able to calculate the, um, the carbon footprint of this model and to, to, to choose some, some model who are really, uh, who have less uh, carbon footprint. So that are the, the four pillar and how uh, we will uh, achieve so uh, those pillars uh, how uh, what 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 are the work that we are today doing to achieve it so for this um, as a company uh, we are in the program of uh, what we confiance ai so trusted ai launched by uh, the french government with several industrial and also several researchers coming from several university and academic to help us to build this trusted ai what is what we call the Grand Défi, so the big challenge uh, launched by the French government. So uh, is one of the challenges uh, launched by the French government because there are five, uh, one in the cloud, the other one is uh, the quantum, and I don't remember the other one, it, it was yeah, in health, healthcare, and the one if, is AI. So uh, it's uh, funded by the government, but also by all the industrials, uh, the, the industrial mentioned uh, here before. So. The idea of this um, of this confidence AI is to uh, build uh, platforms or in, uh, systems who will secure, certify, and make reliable all AI systems, all systems so based on AI. So we have technological pillar. It's more safe design of AI systems, evaluation pillar, so to be able to evaluate and to ensure the trustworthy works. And standard pillar, it's more to have an appropriate, uh, appropriate and a normative environment based on AI. So in this, um, in this program, uh, we are and this, people from industry and people from academy. We work together in the same location uh in uh, paris Saclay, and also in uh, toulouse we work really together uh, in the same location to build this new uh, this uh, future platforms uh it's uh, the, the the program starts one year ago and we have uh, about seven projects the first one what we call ec1 it's about integration of the use case that we have as an industrial and also use case coming from academy and we create the platforms who will uh, receive those use cases, but also who we will have all the, the infrastructure calculation, the HPC environments, and also uh, the tool uh, who will uh, help the data scientist, the data engineer, and the architect to build uh, this trustworthy AI. The project two, it's more about to define the process, the methodology and the guideline to respect um, the, the new rules who will come in from uh, different governments and also uh, to, to, be, to be sure that the, uh, those new rules will be implemented in Confiance AI program and it's in each project from one to seven. The project three, four, five, that are the most important in terms of trustworthy because the, 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 the project three, it's about to, cut, to, characterize, uh, to, to, do, to give the characterization and the qualification of trustworthy AI in, term, in technical development using model, algorithm, and data set. Typically, as industry, I have already developed a product based on AI. The idea of this project EC3 is to develop the algorithm and the methodology who will audit and to verify that my algorithm and my system based on AI uh, can be qualified as, as trusted AI environment. So it's more algorithm who will verify the trustworthy AI. Uh, the EC4, the project 4, it's to, uh, to build and to design the algorithm that are trustworthy by design. So it's more in terms of conception and uh, to be sure at the end that uh, to, to, to define and to have the right algorithm who are trustworthy by design. 
the, the five one, it's uh, really focused on the data. When we have a data set, how we can verify with algorithm, with methodology and with tools that uh, those data sets are good with a good quality without bias. And also to have a methodology and algorithm who are able to, veri to, to verify that this algorithm uh, will cre create bias or this one is a good one to be implemented and to be uh, deployed in, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on the environment to, to, to ensure uh, the trustworthiness of, uh, of AI. The project sec uh, six, it's more about uh, all um, the models, the mathematical model and all the tooling who will ensure the validation, the verification and of the qualification uh, toward the homologation and the certification of platform and product uh, and project based on AI or using AI uh, in their systems. Uh, the, the last one, it's about embedded AI, because we can uh, create an AI algorithm to deploy it in a, a HPC environment, for example, on, on server, but it cannot be adapted to, uh, to nano edge or to, uh, to the normal edge. So the idea here is really to, to work on the embedded AI. So that are the, the seven uh, projects that we are, where we are working on to, um, to be able to achieve uh, the trusted uh, platform and trusted environment by, based on AI. I give you, uh, we, we worked on several uh, examples and several use cases on this, um, on this topic and uh, on this project because each project will take a use case. Uh, and we will uh, go from end to end, from data collection to uh, to visualization to, uh, to to the results on this use case to re to verify all this methodology that we are developing uh, de developing here in those projects. And one of them is about re-identification uh, systems. So it's not only detection or segmentation of image or of video. The idea is really to re-identificate people uh, and. Do as I, I show you here, we can have low similarity, but also we can have high similarity in terms of image that we have in the video. And the idea is to do this identification in, in real time. For example, we have this case in, uh, in smart city when we are um, uh, trying to identify person from uh, from uh, avenue to another. We have also some uh, in, in the same uh, model that we develop it to re-identificate re uh, people. The idea is to use it also for vehicle and also for vessel. We we have in results several paper in this area, and also it can be for re-identification of luggage in the airport in, uh, in real time when we, when we are for for example uh, missing of uh, some luggage. Uh, also, it can be for clothes. So several topics, but the idea is to use the same model uh, to do all uh, all those stuff. So motivation that today in computer vision uh, we have uh, more and a lot of um, uh, algorithm and paper um, related to detection, segmentation, and classification. And here the idea is to go more on uh, visual similar, uh, similarity learning, and it's not the same, not the same in terms of um, of learning and also in terms of uh, metric of ev evaluation of those algorithms. Because we, here we, we will use more uh, example of, for example, CMC or uh, MAP uh, metrics to evaluate uh, the accuracy of the model and also different manner to do the learning phase uh, because the metric of learning are different. Uh, here, for example, I give the example of triplet loss. So, so then there are quite difference between uh, this topic to uh, to those related to detection or segmentation or classification that we can have on on video intelligence system or uh, or uh, or image uh, or computer uh, vision in general so many and many academic data set that we have in this program and we use coming from university and academic work but also uh, we have a synthetic data generator because we are creating uh, we are working also with gan uh, algorithm and the idea is to create more and more uh, da synthetic data and to verify that in industrial world the synthetic data will really um, give a huge value uh, to uh, uh, to the product and to uh, to the use cases so uh, 
here the challenge, if I give you an example, if we look to the first data set that we call market and to the second one, uh, in theory, we see that if we do the learning in the first data set and the inference in the second one, we, we will have a, a good results. So when we work on this, what we um, uh, what we observe that from this data set market to market from training to inference, we have really a good accuracy, about 90% uh, and up to 90%. Uh, so if we do the learning on the first data set and we do the inference in the, in the, in the other data set, we have less than 20% of accuracy. And te in theory, if we look at the image, it looks the same. But there are some differences in terms of color, in terms of, of uh, also of, uh, of environment, and that's why it's very important for us to uh, to work on these topics about uh, domain adaptation, about uh, re-identification systems, uh, and not only detection or, cl or classification. So uh, the challenge that we starting to work and the algorithm that we start to, uh, to implement here uh, for the EC4, uh, remember the project about design for trustworthy AI, it's about how to learn a representation robust to pose variation. So view angle change, for example, I'm um, do the learning in, um, in the morning and uh, the inference it's more in the night. So different ang uh, angle and the idea is to develop the model who will be adapted from uh, the, when we change the, the environment to stay with the same uh, performance and also how to learn our representation robust to domain shift for example i do the learning in new york and we are do the inference uh, in france so the idea here, here also is to keep the same accuracy and the same performance and also it's uh, how to uh, to to, to build uh, an, an adaptive algorithm uh, who will be able to uh, to keep this performance uh, towards domain adaptation. So also uh, working on continual learning, so it can be useful for uh, for such a systems where we have a continuously changing environments and also how synthetic data can improve a re-identification system. So uh, there is really growing interest in terms of uh, also our person and vehicle uh, re-identification from industrial and also from research community. It's about, uh, I think, 30 paper uh, in 2021 about these topics. So uh, that was what I wanted to uh, to share with you uh, today uh, about our challenges, uh, what we are doing. And uh, so thank you for uh, for your uh, for your for presence today. We thank you so much, Dr. Carter, for your presentation. Um, next up on the program, um, also joining us online. Uh, okay. Okay. So um, the next the next item on the program will then be um, Dr. Roxana Ojira, the CTO at Comsys SAS France, online together with Prof. Uh, Juani. And the topic is titled, um, To What Hello Wi-Fi-Based Product Design for Massive IoT. Over to you, Dr. Roxana Ojira, and also to Prof. Juani. Thank you so much. Hello? Disable. Now? You see, uh, we see you, but we don't see your screen. Now? Good. <laughs> uh, can you just pass on presentation mode, please? Yes. 
Uh, we, we can earn presentation from our side if you have challenges. You see the presentation? We see it, but can you put it in uh, presentation mode? And we can start. It's not. That is? No. Uh, Alexana, we can. We, we, uh, yeah. Yeah. Here? No? Not yet. We can we can do it from our side if you if you if you want. If you prefer. Okay, we can share it from our side and you talk I will follow with you. Ah, it's it's okay. Perfect. Okay, let's go. May I start with the presentation concerning the massive IoT um, product. Uh, which uh, is designed by uh, XRP and consists. Next, please. Consist is uh, working on the physical layer. Um, the physical layer is a basic recommendation. Up to now, we have uh, implemented the mandatory uh, features that is in particular the one and two megahertz bandwidth mode but uh, uh, we have planned uh, to develop uh, the 16 megahertz bandwidth mode in order to reach 347 megabits per second uh, here uh, they are the, the mandatory uh, features that are uh, listed uh, concerning the main modules uh, required by the recommendation as the binary coding, uh, the pilots, and so on. And uh, uh, also, uh, I have listed the algorithms needed to uh, correct the uh, hardware distortion. Then the, the IP includes, the, the physical layer include the, the fields that uh, allows the receiver to correct errors and distortion. Here you have the steam of the receiver. Uh, all this module uh, implements the structure frame, in, uh, which is in the bottom. Uh, as I said, the first part are the training symbol that uh, allows the, the receiver to recognize the frame and uh, correct the hardware distortion. The uh, data field include the coded uh, information bits. This one, please. This is the structure of the receiver. The, as I say, there are uh, two, uh, two parts. Uh, two um, correct distortion, as I say, the, uh, the first part is composed of module that correct distortion. Uh, that is, for example, the, the frequency offset, the DC offset, uh, allows uh, also uh, to estimate the channel, to track the, the frame, uh, as well as to detect and synchronize the frame. The, the second part the is the decoder of the data field for the um, Sizomol, we have implemented the MHC decoder and the, a maximum likelihood decoder uh, in the case of the um, my modes, um, which uh, we have uh, several uh, spatial strings. It depends on the quality of the receiver, uh, if the um, maximum theoretical uh, throughput can be reached. And uh, of course, also it depends on the uh, efficiency of the MAC layer that uh, will be explained by uh, Professor Tony uh, in the next uh, slides. So, to me, uh, it's done, Luxana. Okay, the the Hello Wi-Fi uh, platform that we are developing is uh, composed on two parts. The part, the physical layer that was explained by uh, by Dr. Roxana, 
is about designing a physical layer up to the standard with some improvement at physical layer that is ready, it's running on the hardware, mm -hmm. and the design of the Mac layer. The Mac layer is in charge of managing the frame that you want to set it on the network. But we are facing a problem to manage very large scale Internet of Things. So you need to adapt the Mac layer from the classical Wi Fi because Halo Wi Fi is how you use. Wi-Fi for Internet of Things is specific for Internet of Things, but how are you going to to manage very large scale of network? So the 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 the, the what we do is that we use virtualization. If you know uh, software defined networking, is that we are virtualizing part of the net of the Mac. The Mac layer is managing the frames that you want to send, and you have a queuing system that manage. Uh, you have a gateway that has a number of nodes that communicate with that gateway, and the gateway has uh, a queuing system that manage all the uh, the frames that come from different nodes to send them to the network, to the cloud. So when you increase the number of nodes, and then the number of queuing system will, will increase. And uh, uh, at the get, uh, gateway, you have uh different quality of service to different kind of message that you are you are using so you will be uh, having very large number of frame that you have to change to to manage with time constraint and uh, spatial uh, complexity with the number of nodes so that what we do is that we, we take the, the high level Mac, which is about managing the scheduling algorithm, and we put it in the cloud on the edge. This is the work of our, of our PhD student, which is Sotenga. So, this is the idea. If you will see, look on the uh, left hand side, you have on down, you have a set of device that no wants to connect to the network. On your gateway, which is the box on the top, you have, you manage different queuing systems that you are able to manage the, the, the frames that you have to send. When you increase the number of nodes and you increase the number of messages that the node needs to send, like in Internet and this real Internet of Things, in this case, you put a pressure on the, on the gateway where we don't have enough memory to manage and computation capacity. So what we, you do, you take that scheduler to the to the edge. What is edge computing is very high speed cloud data center that is close to the to the nodes and have very, very high capacity of computation with very high capacity of networking. So you have the capacity to manage uh, a lot of data. What you push is that you keep uh, simple queuing on the gateway and you put the virtual get Mac, what we name virtual Mac on the on the edge. But how it is, it works out is that you use as you are on the uh, uh, on the cloud, on the edge cloud, you 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 use uh, virtualization capacity as virtual machine to duplicate. As you need the resources, you you will generate a new virtual machine to manage uh, the load, or you use container. What so? doesn't change anything. So it's the capacity in managed by you of uh, managing a number of uh, virtual machines. So that's what you do. Uh, this is the ar full architecture. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, left hand side, you have the nodes that communicate with a given gateway. The gateway will make use of this software defined networking that will manage the part of the, what we name northbound, southbound, Depends on the data and the control that control at the uh, at the uh, cloud and the uh, the data what we call port forwarding at the at the uh, south band or at the hardware. So that's what we have. You have on the, your hand uh, right hand side you have your uh, your edge computing where everything is happening. This is a kind of application how you validate what you are doing. You go from industrial automation, agricultural monitoring, logistic and transportation, and smart metering. Smart metering is very small data that you, you send, like your water meter or electricity meter in your house that we, needs to be sent to ESCOM or to uh, water municipality. Uh, industrial automation is very uh, uh, 
constraint the critical communication in industry context i see for ir agriculture monitoring you have to collect set of data on the given land and you have to send them to the cloud transport and logistics that is classic logistics in what in uh, warehouses or transportation system where you need depending on criticality of the application you have to send data you see that when you increase the number of nodes you have a decrease in your throughput for the classical approach but when you use the approach of virtualization you see that we are able to manage to some uh, extent the, the the number of nodes that you are able to manage in different kind of situation uh, that's it so thank you very much thank you Thank you so much to Dr. Ojeda as well as Prof. Giovanni. Um, next up, once again, we are in a hybrid seminar. So the next speaker will address the Sachi Chair on the subject of research and innovation at RICE Research Center. And joining us online is Professor Eric Madsen. He is uh, from uh, Purdue University, and he is also the co-founder of M2M Lab. Welcome, um, Professor Metzen. Uh, we welcome you over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. And what's the way to share the screen in uh, Teams? Uh, here. Can you see it now? All right, thank you very much. All right, everybody. Um, uh, thank you uh, for the invitation, and I appreciate I'm coming from the US where it's actually quite early in the morning here, um, and it's a holiday, and it's also my birthday, so um, I appreciate having uh, the chance to share all those things with you. Uh, today, what I'm going to talk about is uh, not directly healthcare related, but it's in the prevention of causing harm to humans. And so in our lab, we do a lot of things with counter UAV and uh, AI and many other things. And so today I'll talk about that uh, briefly. All right, so just basically a background uh, UAV detection and discussion, and I'll try, try to keep it under my um, uh, time here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thanks once again this year uh, for my invitation to FSATI and, and uh, TUT. Uh, I wish I could be there with you in person, but due to the uh, issues with COVID, obviously, hopefully next year, uh, I look forward to another return to uh, your beautiful country. Now, just a quick introduction um, for those of you that haven't or are not familiar with Purdue, Purdue's in the U.S., it's founded in 1869, has about 45,000 students, and we're kind of a special type of university in the, the U.S. that when the U.S. was expanding, they created one special university for each state uh, that only focused in science, technology, engineering, and agriculture, and, and Purdue's been remarkably successful in those areas. But it's not a place where you'd come for like foreign language or music study because we are not good at those things. All right. Now, our lab, uh, and we have right now about 16 graduate students, and uh, and we've had graduate students from many, many different countries, uh, 29 different countries. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll have one from South Africa soon. Uh, we have a couple of students working with us from Africa now, but uh, different countries. And we also conduct projects in, in a number of different countries with many different partnerships. Um, and hopefully, we can also establish some good uh, research partnerships with uh, TUT and FSEPI. Now, the other part of this is we have a, the, what's called the Korean Software Square. It's a large building in this building you see here. Uh, and in the background, I like this picture because there's actually a tornado, a uh, big spinning storm uh, that we took on this. And that's one of the things we do is after disasters that we help out. Our research is based on AI and robotics primarily for 
people involved in safety, police, firefighters, first responders, uh, security after disasters, not only in the US, but in other places. Uh, we've done a lot of work with counterterrorism, especially in the, the days we have today where uh, technology is being used, um, such as UAVs, uh, autonomous cars, autonomous vehicles. But we also do work with agriculture. We're doing quite a bit of work with uh, applying AI to agriculture and also some robots for health. We have uh, two fairly large labs, so at any given time, we might have 50 or 60 people working on these different projects from all over the world. And so we're, we're sort of applied where we applying advanced to new theories uh, to real world problems, and that's kind of our focus. Now, let me tell you a little about today's the today. The project I want to talk about is an acoustic project we did for uh, counter UAV. Now, before we get into that, we want to talk a little bit about the whole world of counter UAV. How do we stop uh, small drones, small UAVs from invading our space, carrying out terrorist attacks, doing all kinds of bad things, even being nuisances? And so we have this counter UAV flow um, before. If a UAV is bad, you can detect it. Then you have to be able to track it uh, in the US because of our laws. If I have a UAV and it's flying over my property and I take it down and destroy it, um, I'm technically a terrorist myself. And if I take control of it and um, hold it, then I'm technically a pirate. So we have to be very careful and laws around the world change. But we want to detect something. We want to track it. We want to categorize it if it's a threat and then make a decision um, and then remediate, either take it down, let it go, do whatever. And then if we take it down, we want to perform for forensics. So today what we're going to really kind of look at is a project we did for uh, not only tracking and detecting, but also deciding categorization. So the need for real world adaptable solutions, uh, which dem demonstrate that an array of acoustic sensors can be used to detect and estimate the detection of arrival. So when we have a bad UAV coming at us, a lot of the times the sensors that we have currently, even the, all the commercial sensors don't necessarily work well for uh, detecting UAVs. We just carried out a large project with the government. I really can't talk about it. But what we, the only one thing I can share is that we found that most of the systems for the top 10 or 15 vendors out there in the world don't really work very well and provide almost no protection. Right now, what we want to do is we want to provide these solutions um, that are available for everybody because Department of Defense has a large budget. Local police precincts do not. All right, so the, the mission with this project was to develop and validate a low cost acoustic detection system to alert in real time about the position and direction arrival of, of a harmful UAV relative to some target. Maybe it's a rock concert, maybe it's a football game, uh, maybe it's a political speech. Uh, all of those things have been attacked in the recent past. So the deliverables we had out of this project, one is a work, working acoustic sensing device, um, and we have this. And, and act, in fact, some of the, the basic research work of this uh, was done by an intern that we had that had come over from uh, UPEC uh, um, in Paris that we work with uh, uh, Kareem and Abdelghani and, and those um, who had come to work on an internship with us. The software to process sound signals, calculate and visualize the results, a network protocols to communicate and distribute the technology, and finally performance and cost analysis. Now the whole idea from a system design is this. We want to take in um, a UAV, and if you look at kind of down at the bottom, we have a target. But to create a, a, a cost efficient, accessible um, system, and by accessible meaning anybody can access the technology, you don't have to have a giant budget, uh, so it's kind of economic assess, uh, accessibility. The whole idea is the UAV is flying at a target. We want to put up microphones to be able to detect it. This is actually a very good way. Um, because acoustic signatures are a very solid way of actually detecting UAVs, no matter what level they're flying at. And the whole point is we want to do this as they fly over. So here's kind of the, the basic acoustic detector. It's nothing more than a microphone. Now, the one we're building now uh, would actually package this into a really nice little 3D printed device. Um, it's run off a, a very low, uh, low end uh, processing board. 
and can be easily networked. So you could have like an ESP um, um, 8266, or I can't remember the, the exact number, um, but a, a small board. And here's kind of the basic process. Now in the short time we have today, I, I won't go into the details of this because that, that would take a couple of hours to really explain it well. Um, but if anybody's interested, please contact me and I'll be happy to go through the research with you. But the whole idea is that, that for sound processing, we're going to take samples of uh, different acoustic signals. Uh, we're going to catalog them. And the whole idea is that um, you match them up with uh, different UAVs that might fly over. And they're easily distinguished between uh, UAV signals and things such as birds, wind, other ambient noise in the environment. Um, now, the one thing that is really relevant to this is there's kind of what we've discovered, and this is part of the, the categorization that I described earlier, is a UAV flying over that is straight out of the box, um, has the standard acoustic signature of being like a DJ Phantom or um, a newer version straight out of the box, is not considered too dangerous. If you have one that's not out of the box, which means it's carrying a payload, uh, that changes the acoustic signature, that changes uh, the threat level, because the threat level at that point means that it's probably carrying some spray that to spray a crowd uh, with some infectious disease, or it's carrying a, a kilo of Simtex with an, a, a GPS trigger or something of that nature, hand grenades. There's many, many things that have been employed uh, by different terrorist groups um, and insurgencies. And so that's one of the things we're doing, not only looking at detecting, but also categorizing, categorizing the actual threat level. So if we look at, and we kind of looked at it as far as gathering data, one second samples, one second classifier, the final prediction, you know, UAV or noise. Uh, we look at one second samples uh, to predict UAV or noise. And it would kind of take on a, a slight voting method. The whole idea is that we have to make a decision very quickly about what kind of threat this uh, uh, UAV would be that's that's flying into our perimeter. And so here's kind of the idea. Um, we put out these different systems. Uh, we have the microphones. The microphones basically are spread out around some perimeter or some wall, kind of virtual wall, uh, with the idea that uh, we look at the different arrival times and the different detection times. And not only can we tell kind of the angle of attack, because that's very important because um, acoustic detection is not so good at tracking necessarily, but it's very good at detecting and it gives you almost foolproof way of detection. Once you know in which direction the bad UAV is coming from, then you can start aiming your other more focused resources such as radar, LIDAR, um, and things such as that. Now, the whole idea here too is uh, we're looking at the intensity change in the the noise, and that's going to change. But you also look at the difference. So the, if we have two microphones that are split at a 25 meter interval, we want to be able to detect uh, where in that interval um, that UAV would be. Now, once again, this is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, and there's a lot of variables such as uh, angle of attack, how high it is, um, you know what's what else is happening but the acoustic signatures are uh pretty steady one thing we are doing on the side if any people have interest is we're also building uh and we're working this next year to create a catalog of acoustic signature signatures we can share with other people because there's really nothing that exists like that uh, out there so here's kind of a basic setup this is just a gps map um and sort of if you can see the three green dots there or the green circles, those are where our um, um, on an open street map where our, our sensors would be. And we had a UAV fly in and what you see, this is kind of the interface you would see. It's a very crude, simple interface, at least for right now. But if you set this up, you're you could automatically set up your open street map to see where all the microphone and acoustic listening devices were. And this is a signal you would get or the visual signal you would get when a bad UAV or any UAV would actually fly into your perimeter that you can detect. So you would see um, the two microphones that uh, are two listening devices that detected it. 
uh, would basically turn red. And then the one that's closest uh, by this method would um, um, circle the UAV so you could get the angle of, uh, of attack. Now here's some just basic pictures. We did this uh, and you can see we have our acoustic sensor. We have a central server. It's a very mobile system, but that's what the police want. We looked at uh, DJ Phantom 4. We looked at EV2 Pro, which are both very common UAVs. And if you notice, we put the water bottle on there because not only does that uh, give us a very easy and cheap way to uh, uh, put a load on something, it also allows us to test with a load that would be similar to a Simtex or C4 or other some common explosive that's uh, easily accessible in um, a number of places around the world. So here's kind of the setup. Now we looked at uh, the training data and the training data here um, basically is collected along this path and we did these in 10 meter intervals. Uh, so here you can see kind of the setup. And this is just a very common DJ that would be set up. So we did this out in a large field uh, close to Purdue. There's one of my grad students who's doing the flying. And so here, well, this is kind of the, the basics of this. We collected a lot of samples just from our test data uh, with loaded and unloaded DJs and Phantoms and EVs and things like this. So it's not a lot, but for this kind of work, it's it's sufficient to um, to execute. And then we looked at you know the performance data uh, going along uh, different kinds of markers. Um, now I won't go into this in a lot, but uh, the detection performance did work quite well. Uh, there are pluses and minuses. In the U.S. government, if they if you look at actually their banners, they're in many cases happy when you can detect one third of the time. Um, we have a little bit higher uh, with this. Uh, um, with this particular technique. Now we did kind of three different tests. We looked at perpendicular attack, attack where it's coming straight at you, kind of along um, an axis, and you have your uh, assets spread out. We looked at a horizontal attack where it's coming in sideways. Um, and some of the conclusions we looked at, if we look at sort of some of the basic research questions we have, is how accurate, precise, and cost effective is the solution? So we did attain an accuracy of 95% uh, for actual detection and a precision of 90, 93 for UAV detection. Now that doesn't mean we were always correct. By, any, by no means were we always correct. That means that we heard something that had a, a similar signature to uh, a UAV. Um, maximum average position error of six meters. If you look at something that's spread out, that's actually quite good. We're very, very happy with that. And the best thing is, from an accessible standpoint, the whole system costs less than $7,500 per node or $75 per node. So if you wanted to put 100 nodes around um, a building, it would cost you only about uh, 7,500 uh, US dollars, which compared to current technology, which costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's very cheap. Uh, what air level on position and direction of uh, arrival can be achieved? Um, about a 0.33 uh, prediction error, uh, but that does take a few seconds. Now, time is very important here, so we'd like to improve that. Um, when you think about a UAV that's traveling 20 meters per second, um, if you detect at 1,000 meters, you don't have a lot of time to react to uh, secure the target. What's the response time? Prediction at a maximum of 5.7 uh, uh, milliseconds on average and uh, 1.59 seconds on average. And then what's the minimum cost while keeping acceptable performance? Now the cost of this to make it accessible can be reduced if using cheaper components or buying a quantity, which uh, we would if it was a, a bigger deployment. And the system could work properly with components with less computing power. Then the basic way we train the system and built it is you could go with things like Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and so we want very low power because that means typically very low cost, uh, very accessible, very transportable, and all of those things. So this is one of the newest projects we've come up with, uh, with some very good um, outcomes.
Thank you very much, and hopefully I stayed within my time or a little beyond it. Thank you. The chance to speak here. Thanks so much, Professor Metzen. Um, with an indication from IT, I'm wondering if we have the next speaker on, online. We do, all right. Um, I'd therefore like to call upon, or rather welcome Associate Professor Chibani, who is from LISI Laboratory from UPEC. And um, his topic is titled Bridging the Semantic Gap Between Context Sensing from IoT and Context Aware uh, Decision in Ambient Assistant Living and eHealth. Let us welcome um, Associate Professor Chibani um, to the platform. Over to you, Professor Chibani. Thank you so much. Yeah, sorry, I was uh, on mute. I don't know if you hear me uh, very well. Hello? Uh, so, I don't, I don't know if you hear me. Uh, it should be fine like that. Hello? Sorry for, uh, I, yes, th thank you. Uh, I, I am present, yeah, sorry, I'm presenting from my car, but I, I have uh, another situation than Eric. My uh, son have an emergency uh, case and I have to go from Paris to the north of France to, to, to see him. Uh, so my, my talk today is uh, about our progress in one of uh, the uh, some European projects that we have conducted with um, Professor Joani in the Lisi laboratory. And we are uh, trying to work on this problem of um, solving the semantic gap. So our research work in a domain where we try to cater between um, uh, ubiquitous computing and artificial intelligence. So we call this topic uh, ubiquitous intelligence. So if we try to integrate uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of things uh, and robotics and the ubiquitous computing and artificial intelligence together to create methodologies for uh, uh, learning model, extracting sufficient knowledge and trying to emphasize on this knowledge by using expert knowledge that are based on symbolic artificial intelligence. So the objective for this development is to endow our system with context awareness, because this is very important for an autonomous system to be uh, context aware in order to be able at least to detect problem in the perceptions, problem in the predictions, and try to uh, solve them. Uh, being context aware allows the system to be able to adapt uh, its actuation or its decision. So being context aware also is a way also to provide natural interactions between the artificial intelligence and robots and uh, humans. And context will help us in enabling uh, autonomous pl uh, planning of tasks and orchestrations of tasks and services. So all of that, we try to validate it in uh, decision support applications, especially in healthcare. Uh, like what have been presented by Wagdi Zahran. We have uh, uh, Middle Ocean who was with this uh, company and with Atos. Uh, and also in uh, um, applications for, for robotics. So uh, we have, uh, we are developing that in, uh, uh, in the story started from 2009 and we realized in uh, more than 12 uh, European projects. So our architecture, is uh, enabled by different, uh, let's say, ubiquitous intelligence enablers uh, that starts from the IoT, which is the environment for data collection and actuation. The problem in the IoT, the, we have two big problems. The first one is heterogeneity. We have different technologies, different data formats, and uh, this uh, data suffers from uh, the, the different problems that impact the uncertainty and the vagueness that we can uh, uh, in the knowledge that we can obtain from this data. So we try to solve uh, the first uh, stage, the heterogeneity problem, by putting an interoperability semantic layer 
to uh, make that all the data that will be collected will be represented in the same formalism. Now, uh, in the edge, we try to learn from these data that are um, uh, represented in, in the same way and uh, 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 where the metrics are the same and the, the, the uh, quantitative and qualitative parameters are the same. So we try to learn efficient models that allows to do some interpretations and insight extractions from this data in continuous way. So in the beginning, we, we were working on supervised learning that has a big uh, problems, especially the out, uh, uh, that models are, are, are outdated quickly. And now we are moving to active learning. So in the cloud, we try to emphasize on the knowledge that uh, 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 how can provide a model for recognizing emotions uh, locally from sensors with models for for emotional recognition that uh, ha, uh, that are at Facebook or that are by Google Google exporting API. So what we do, we try to learn from this API every time we use a cognitive service. So we try to learn from it. Today, what we do, we call a service which has, uh, let's say, uh, a hided model that gives an inference. So we try to learn from inference and enhance the model that we have in the edge. So this is the, the way we try to uh, uh, leverage this architecture. So we have at the end two kinds of uh, artificial intelligence, one in the at the edge level and the other is the uh, at the public uh, uh, cloud level. Now uh, our models, our systems, we can see them as agents. So all the agents have all the same architecture. That means they have a machine learning uh, system that allows to learn models uh, in an active way. These models provides knowledge that will be added to the existing knowledge that have the agent. So our the idea that the designer of the agent will provide to this agent a priori knowledge. So this knowledge have some semantics. The model will learn new knowledge that has, let's say, low level uh, semantic. So this low level semantic will be mixed with the high level semantic that, that were given by the expert that they have designed this agent. And by having the two uh, knowledge, we have a complete knowledge that allows the system to plan the actions to reach the objectives that has been uh, provided by the user. So we will have a third, uh, let's say, component, which is the contextual actions, which are the plans that can be generated from this knowledge, and especially the knowledge that corresponds to the objectives that have been defined by the user. So we run these systems uh, in applications that are ambient assisted living, which is the main topic of uh, the Sarsi chair. And uh, we have built uh, a living lab that I think have been presented by Professor Juani, and you have seen the video there in uh, in the in the conference. So the the first component, which is the critical one, is machine learning because it's the way to uh, make a reconciliation or synchronization between what have been defined as a pioneer knowledge by the expert and what will be learned by the agent from the observations uh, coming from the the sensors. So what means context awareness? Context awareness in our domain, which is ambient assisted living, is the situation of uh, the user, of the users, because sometimes we have to assist not only an elderly living alone, but maybe a group of people. That means the elderly, the caregiver, the uh, uh, family or the friends. So we need that the system has to capture the context of these people. So we are targeting to model and learn uh, uh, several context, uh, context attributes. The first context attribute, which is the situation. The second one is an activity, because an activity is holding all
two ways. It can be an individual activity. A group. Network problem. Do, do you hear me? Yeah, it's okay. So our uh, yeah. That, that, okay, okay. Th that's fine with the slides. They are displayed. Oh, so, so to learn by using different machine learning techniques ranges from situations, activities emotions, intentions, and behavior. So uh, today we have uh, some uh, interesting contributions for uh, modeling situations, and in particular by using uh, IoT, by using um, a radio uh, network like Zigbee, trying to get the situation of the user by using the, uh, the, uh, the different sensors that are in the uh, neighborhood of the uh, uh, user location. So we can get a nice interact with different levels of activities of daily living. And we are able to do uh, emotion recognition by uh, the, uh, kinds of data, it can be from uh, voice, can be from uh, uh, video, and also it can be from the text when people are chatting. And uh, it can be by the combination of uh, these uh, different uh, parameters. So the intention is the next activity. So we today we are trying to model two kinds of intention. Let's say the low level intention, which is for the motion and uh, um, one of our PhD students uh, who is now working from Honda, for Honda, sorry, has presented you his uh, works on uh, intention recognition uh, for trying to analyze the uh, movement of the hand and trying to understand what the user is intending to, to, uh, to uh, which object is intended to interact with and what kind of activity that can be done and is leveraging a uh, uh, reasoning system. Uh, we have also carried work on uh, trying to understand the uh, the behavior. So activities can be done in different ways. Activities are related to emotions, related to situations. So we can, by combining these parameters together, we can infer an, an additional parameter or attribute of the context, which is the behavior. So activities can be... Uh, and behavior is a characterization of this activity or a style of doing this activity. So today we are trying to understand the routines of, of people and also um, uh, abnormalities uh, according to these routines and exceptions in the activities that can happen uh, uh, daily. So how we can link these different uh, models together in the system so if I train the system to recognize the emotion, my system is completely ignoring the activity of the user. It's completely ignoring the situation, which is a problem. Well, it's a model that can take care about the different parameters. And for that, we need a semantic layer for trying to link these independent models. Uh, so what we do, so we have created what we call them uh, enablers, so different mechanisms to link together this, um, these models and this, and we try to make them specialized by the different problems we want to, uh, let's say, solve in the ambient assisted living, especially uh, understanding human behavior, at least characterizing if there is an anomaly and giving some uh, support for the decision whatever the environment in which the event occurs. That means we want to make our model robust uh, with regards to the different changes in the uh, uh, in the environment that means if the event the same activity happens in the morning in the afternoon so our system is able to recognize in a perfect way this activity but i want that my system can be able to say that this activity that has been predicted with 70 percent is happening in this context so how i can link 
the activity with this situation. So we try to work in that by automating this process. That means avoiding to write some deterministic rules to say uh, if it is uh, morning and this activity one and this situation two, I can say that activity one, situation two are related together. This does not make sense in a human environment because it's highly dynamic. Maybe in in this in a, in a industrial um, uh, factory uh, shop, we can do that because the environment is a little bit deterministic. But we have some unpredictable events that happens like accidents. But in a, in a human environment, what can be uh, an exception for a user can be a normal case for another user. But what we try to do are hybrid reasoning models. So we try to connect together formal systems that uh, we call ontologies with some, let's say, logical system that are based on first order logic and especially on uh, kind of fragments of uh, the, uh, the first order logics which are action theories where the uh, computation or the calculus is done not on the predicates because in predicates we are more working on proofs but what just calculating the relationship between effects by by taking into account the changes that can happen in the environment that in changes between an effect and another so we use the ontological model as a terminology a basis for the expert to write rules and we use the different logics, the dialects, uh, to create what you call them reasoning engines for solving different problems that I have uh, defined uh, uh, beforehand for how I can link the different contextual attributes, especially recognizing them, making what we call them causal reasoning, understanding what was the previous context, what is the link between a situation uh, that happens two minutes before, with the current situation with an happening now. So trying to uh, enable the system to do computations for linking uh, this, uh, this context attribute di uh, directly. The big problem that we are using predictive, sorry, okay. So uh, in this case, we try to handle uh, uncertainties and we uh, build this uh, methodologies that combine all these tools. So today we have developed uh, a complete framework that uh, that is delivered in a complete software package that uh, where we can have a middleware for Internet of Things that do the conversion of raw data into semantic knowledge. And this semantic knowledge is processed by different rezoning system that are defined by experts and interplays with a different machine learning model that operate in parallel way with the reasoning that uh, learns from the data captured by this uh, middleware. Uh, so uh, this uh, middleware is integrated in uh, at the edge level uh, and also at the cloud level. And uh, we make this interplay uh, between a cloud uh, level to have uh, application to uh, for the user where you can use them to a robot or uh, through a smartphone. And on the low level, the middleware for the IoT is uh, running at the device level, like running on the uh, IoT gateway or on the robot that uh, that is connected uh, directly through uh, wireless sensor network to the different, uh, um, let's say, uh, sensors that we have in the environment. So this uh, works has been published in different uh, 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 nice quality journals and uh, if there is some you are open to collaboration so we will be very happy to share uh, with you our uh, let's say um, uh, our attempts and you have uh, professor uh, uh, Karim Juani locally so it will be very helpful is uh, one of the principal investigators of, uh, of this work so uh, thank you for giving me this time and I hope that uh, you find my presentation interesting Thank you so much, Professor Chibani. Um, that concludes the keynote addresses of today to the Saatchi Chair um, um, in uh, the Enabled Environment and Assistive Living. Um, without any further waste of time, I'd like to call uh, Prof. Chibani to please come and wrap up um, this seminar for us and for the open discussion. Thank you so much. Over to you, Professor Chibani. Thank you, Program Director. 
So it was, thank you. Thank you. It was very interesting two days during uh, which we have exchanged on different topics, different area of research and interest that can come up with a new project, a new collaboration. We touch a different thing from robotics design for assisted living to, uh, to healthcare, to, uh, to artificial intelligence in general case for uh, for assistive living, but also in different other domain like like uh, uh, medicine or uh, chemistry and material science, and also to support technology for communication like Internet of Things. I thank uh, especially the uh, DVC uh, uh, research for her uh, strong support and uh, for having pushing us to to do this seminar. It was it was uh, very very. Uh, important support for us and from the faculty and from the university in general. So, and uh, my gratitude goes to uh, uh, to our environment, especially Prof. Anish Korean. He was the main pillar for this. So, thank you very much, Prof. And to all the the colleagues and the researchers that make time to to be here or online to support us and to present to our guests, especially to our guests coming from France. Long way. We have bad news. I closing the border. I don't think that we will be able to go home. So I'm sorry. But in any case, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, uh, Abdel Raouf, uh, and Luc, and especially ja Dr. Ja uh, Jalonk, his cyclist. He, did, he gave a talk on 24th in our environment. It was very, very interesting on this dynamic of emotion expression, uh, expressed and we are looking forward to establish a relation in that. So thank you very much to all the colleagues in France, United States, Germany, here in South Africa that make time to come long away here or to assist remotely and give us interesting talk like my one uh, Guillaume was telling, uh, you have a minimum couple of years to, 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 to get out of all what have been seen. Uh, it's rich. It's really, really rich. There's a lot, a lot of interesting information that you can get out of all the presentation and try to to get to other projects and collaboration. Thank you, thank you very much, and hope you enjoy your rest of the day. And see you soon next year in Pretoria for our next seminar. Hopefully, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Giovanni. Um, that concludes our program. Um, and um, I'd like to really thank you so much for your cooperative participation in the program in the last two days. Thank you so much. You have made my job easier as your program director. I really want to appreciate um, your participation. Um, at this point in time, I'd like to call then uh, Professor Munda to please come and do the closing and vote of thanks. Professor Munda is the Assistant Dean uh, for PG R&I as well as from the Faculty of Engineering and Build in um, Environment. Over to you, Professor Munda. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. I think my job has been made easier by Karim. He's done the the part of appreciations for me. Yes, but it's been a long uh, journey, two days of great uh, presentations. Uh, yesterday we had uh, the opening by our Vice Chancellor and Principal, uh, who was then joined by His Excellency the Ambassador of France to South Africa. Today we've and we had lots of presentations yesterday. Uh, today we've had another round of great presentations that uh, demonstrate the power of research and innovation, especially in our field where we do mainly applied research or translational research that finds use in real life in industry. I will not want to go. We are ending with the rain now. Our colleagues from France are already being uh, scared with the news coming around. The border is being closed. 
and we don't want to keep them delayed any further. But from morning, from uh, Eric's presentation, uh, with uh, many possible areas of collaboration, we've got a Faculty of Arts and Design in TUT, where one of the programs is dance, and we know there are a number of our students or potential students who might be scared because of their uh, uh, disabilities, but there's hope in the work that researchers are doing. Uh, we had talks which border uh, long health sciences, and we've got uh, colleagues in TUT who are working that space as well, so there's common ground for collaboration. Uh, new technologies, the Li-Fi is being used in automotive industry and airplanes. Uh, Luke, thank you very much. But they've gone for a PhD defense, so they're not with us here, but they're still around. Uh, our own colleagues, uh, Prof. Du, the rest have left, uh, not left, but Nico is still here with his team. Nico and Solofelo, great work being done. Our former colleagues and still friends, Guillaume, Dr. Guillaume Noel, was with us a few years ago here. Uh, Prof. Um, Jumo Msiechi from VETS was with us. Uh, we welcome their continued support to the work we do. And there were lots of presentations uh, to patient coaching and monitoring, to Hello Wi-Fi, to especially the last two presenters, Unique uh, from US, Prof. Uh, Eric Matson is very early in the morning. It's his birthday today but he opened the day with presentation to us, which is very welcome. And of course, the last one, having a family problem, but still from the discomfort of his vehicle, he was able then to make his presentation and network connectivity challenges on ubiquitous intelligence, uh, sensors, and so on. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, co colleagues, uh, for a wonderful presentations. I think what has been demonstrated here is the power of, of collaboration, which we are pushing so much as a university. Uh, that has been uh, mentioned yesterday and today by our DVC, Research Innovation and uh, Engagement, who could not join us the whole day today because there's a council meeting that she was attending. Uh, we are demonstrating practical tested uh, research applications. We are, we are presenting more possible areas of research which can find application. We are demonstrating the power of multidisciplinary work so and, and intercontinental engagement, very powerful. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Uh, just to do what Karim has done as well on my behalf, but just a few appreciations. I think uh, I would want to start with the audience uh, you've been wonderful, those connecting online and those with us physically today, despite the challenges you are able to sit the whole day. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to the presenters once again. Uh, you've uh, made our journey in research even more meaningful, a drive to continue doing research. Thank you very much. Uh, we want to thank... Uh, the partners from government departments who were with us yesterday and those who were able to join today and areas where we can then collaborate with them. Uh, thank you very much to our partners from France. You are always with us. At least twice in a year we get to be together as a minimum, which is very, very welcome. Uh, our brothers, uh, they are not just partners from France. Sometimes I call them the three musketeers. Two are right in front of me. One has moved to the left a bit. So yes, uh, if such has been with us for uh, collaboration for about 25 years, as mentioned yesterday, but if there's a team that has taken it to even a different level, especially the two gentlemen in front of me here right now. So Prof. Alex Amam and Prof. Francois Rocare, uh, they've done a great work as they try to retire, researchers don't retire, will continue to be with them. And of course, Karim is still young. We'll make sure that we keep him until our kids are able to join his research team. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, I also want to thank uh, TUT and the management of TUT and our colleagues, especially from R&I Space, 
I see uh, Dr. Raseleka, the Director of Research Innovation, is still with us since yesterday. The colleague in charge of innovation, uh, Dr. Hamilton PD, is with us. From uh, uh, Internationalization Division, we've got Ms. Mashangu with us today. Uh, and of course, we want to thank the Embassy of France for the support and the NRF. But from the organizing team, I want to single out, and Karim mentioned it, Anish Korean Prof, Director of, uh, no Director of FSATI, has done a wonderful job, continues to do a wonderful job. Karim himself was part of the organizing team. Uh, we had uh, full days left. She's left, uh, Ms. Drew from FSATI. Uh, from r and office, we had Dr. Naledi Ntite, Deputy Director. I think she stepped out. Uh, from Corporate Affairs and Marketing, Events Coordination, Mashalane, Sentimule. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, colleagues. And uh, I think I've covered almost everything. But finally, I would want, on behalf of TUT, to thank our program director, you are able to bear with uh, researchers, not very easy to deal with, but you manage them two days from morning to evening, from morning to evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Really appreciate it. You've done a wonderful job. Colleagues, as we close, I'm told Prof. Korean has got some gifts to present, but even as we'll close, just a reminder that COVID is real. It's been about two years now. The fourth wave is just entering South Africa now and it's really scary. Uh, but we will together go through it. Let's obey the protocols. Let's respect ourselves. Let's respect those near us. Let's respect our communities so that together we go through this uh, menace alive. Thank you very much. So, okay, you want me to call them? Yes, please. Okay, so number one, the list, I think, uh, in the order in which they presented, uh, Prof. Eric Bonacelli. Some of them have left. Thank you. Thank you I think those who have uh, who are stepped out, uh, Luke and uh, Prof. Ben Ali, will give them later on. They are attending a PhD defense uh, from France, but they are still around. So we'll give them later on. Dr. Mohamed Hilia. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Guillaume. <laughs> Dr. Noel, you're scared. <laughs> you're sleeping. No, it's, it's, al it's always awake. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. We'll talk. We'll talk about those products. Eh? We'll talk about those products. Some of us have got old parents. And we are also in the energy space. We'll need those solutions. Uh, Nico, Stein, and Solofello. And to our program director, also we've got something small for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ria, for a job well done. We look forward to working with you again. Anish, maybe you can do the rest because the other names are not on my list now, but yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sorry uh, for the confusion. There are a few students that didn't get a gift. Uh, the ones yesterday, I think, got something, but if you didn't get something. Tapelo, did you get something? Please come. 
Simplest and Nadia, please. Uh, just to acknowledge you and uh, thank you for attending. Uh, these are all PhD students with us. He is now a doctor, by the way, is our latest dual doctorate. And I purposely did it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, I think on that note, we can then declare the 2021 Saichi Chair Seminar in Elbert Environment and Assistive Living are officially closed until we meet again in 2022 and make it even better than this year. I think we'll also maybe going forward, also maybe spread the presentations a bit and maybe also get a chance to ask questions and, and go home with answers. Yeah, as well as today when we don't exchange business cards. Yeah, we need to go with discussions and answers already in our pockets. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.